Pokemon Battle and everything Hawaii. These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect Pokemon game. But Shigeru Mori accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction. Story cutscenes. Thus, Pokemon Sun and Moon was born. Using Ultra Shitty Story cutscenes, Lilia, Hao, and Gladion have dedicated their lives to break immersion and make the Pokemon games boring and unplayable. Kidum. Hello fellow Jerry Cans. I am proud to invite you to a new series of mine, Straight Up Reviews. All of my previous videos have been video essays about a certain topic, history, or question that I want to answer, but this series it will be a bit different. Since I've never straight up done a review, on this series I will straight up review any game, movie, TV show, comic, or whatever that I want to talk about. Yeah, I'm not a creative person when it comes to naming. Anyways, the first game up on the list on Straight Up Review is Pokemon Sun and Moon on the 3DS. Released for the Nintendo 3DS in 2016, Game Freak decided to sacrifice Pokemon Z on an altar by gutting it into 100 pieces. Instead, after a year of no Pokemon games in 2015, Game Freak decided we needed another Mew region on the console. And for the second time in franchise history, we got a Mew generation on the same console like Black and White. I remember 5 years ago, I was super stoked to buy these games in 2016. After all, it was my first Mew Pokemon game I bought after turning into an adult. I thought it was going to be like Gen 5 again and I love Black and White. And it was the 20th anniversary of Pokemon. I was sure Game Freak and the Pokemon Company would blow our minds since it was the 20th anniversary, and blow our minds again on the 25th anniversary. Oh, so I bought my copy of Pokemon Moon. And did this game provide me with an enjoyable experience? Hmm, yeah. Is the game great? Uh, eh? Did it live up to the quality that was delivered during Gen 5? Anyways, these games are overshadowed by Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, and are almost forgotten in nature. I wanted to review USUM first because I fucking hate these games, but I realized USUM's failures were failing to improve or straight up worsen Pokemon Sun and Moon. So I felt the need to talk about Sun and Moon first. By the way, I've played this game live, and the footage you'll see is from that. Aw, oh, the elite- the female elite trainers in this game looks amazing, they look really hot. You can see there. ARMPITS! I'm doing this review because I'm referred to as a Poketuber by many. To that I say, I am not a goddamn Poketuber. In fact, I actually like Star Wars better. Fuck Pokemon! Episode 1, The Phantom Positives. I'm not saying the negatives outweigh the positives, but me complaining about the game will be more entertaining for you, Roll, right? So, I'm gonna first mention the clear, non-disputed, non-contested positives of this game in the beginning. Let's talk about the graphics first. The graphics of this game... ...are really good for the 3DS. Yeah, no kidding. Considering the graphics of other 3DS games, I think the graphics are really good, and somehow better than Sword and Shield. Remember the ridiculous low render distance of Sword and Shield? Well, take a look at this. You know, I just realized, I think this game has better draw distance than Sword and Shield, because, um, look at that. Those two trainers, like, far behind. If this was Sword and Shield, we will never see those trainers. Secondly, the characters. The previous two games, that being X and Y and Oras, had problems with characters. All of the gym leaders, Elite Fours of Kalos and Hoenn, were stuck up in their gyms, and most of the time you could only battle them once. They had like 3 or 4 dialogue each, and it was really disappointing. Most of the Kalos gym leaders were so forgettable. I bet $100 you can't name the Force Grass type gym leader in XNY without googling it. His name is Roscoe. No, I lied, his name is Ramos, and you still would have known it if I hadn't told you. Anyways, this game finally fixed it, because there are so many memorable NPCs like Kahunas, Trial Captains, and more. I especially like Team Skull, because they're hilarious, unlike a certain British team, and I fangirl over Guzma Opa too, because I'm a same person. Also, in Gen 6, Game Freak cut corners by having all the trainers use 2D images in battle, which is really fucking distracting and broke immersion. 
Why couldn't they at least model the gym leaders? Finally, in this game, every NPC trainers, including youngsters, are fully rendered 3D models in battle, and all of them are animated pretty well too. You can now see the trainer in battle alongside the Pokemon giving orders as well. And this is much better than Generation 6. Sure, the Pokemon size scaling is bad, but I blame that on the limited hardware of the 3DS. It was not acceptable on the current gen console Sword and Shield. I also really like the region of Alola. Disclaimer, I have never been to Hawaii, so I can't say if this game perfectly captured the spirit of Hawaii. But I really like the aesthetics of the region. It really felt like a tropical island. We also got our first Pokemon Chinatown City and a Japantown City. Neat world building, but I guess no love for my home country, I guess. The Pokemon designs are all great in my opinion, because there are many memorable additions from Gen 7. I am also part of the minority, because I also really like the Ultra Beasts as well. Otherworldly cosmic horror Pokemon is something I didn't know I needed in my life, but man, Buzzwool is fit as hell. The higher difficulty is also welcome. The previous two games were way too easy due to the overpowered EXP share. In the next game, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon were way too hard in some parts. I think this game had the best balance of easy and hard because even though I would never call this game a stressful experience, there are some difficult sections that you need to strategize and put some brain thought into. Also, the music is really good. The game probably has the best trainer battle theme, but all Pokemon games have good music so it's not saying much. Hmm. Those are the positives of the game that I can say without a single drop of doubt. There are still positives of this game left, but you're gonna hear a lot of something is good, but starting from now. Let's begin with Episode 2, Attack of the Island Trials. Let's start breaking down the shit with the biggest new feature of this game, the Island Challenge. So in this game, Game Freak decided that Pokemon games needed their new spin and took out the traditional 8 gym leaders and gyms. Instead, we got the Island Trials. So there are these Island Trial locations and these NPCs called Trial Captains will give you mini games or puzzles to solve. And you have to fight a tough boss Pokemon called Totem Pokemon in the end. On paper, this idea was really good. The Pokemon series was getting stagnated, so getting rid of the gym system that was in every game for 20 years was a nice risk to take and felt refreshing for the series. With much effort and imagination, we could have creative island trials that will be memorable and fun to the player. Let me repeat that. With much effort and imagination, those two words are not something I associate with the current state of Game Freak, because a lot of the island trials feel lazy or half-baked. Yeah, so the concept is good, but First the number. All the previous games had 8 gym leaders. We have 7 island trials for some reason. Why is that? Remember my previous Pokemon video I mentioned how Elite 4 Kahili's content seems to be cut? Also, here's a photo of Akala Island. Do you see this green strip? It's a golf course and you can even see it on the map screen. Also, there is a member of the Alolan Elite 4 that uses flying type, and she has a golf thing going for her. I'll bet my hand, Kahili was supposed to be a trial captain, but Game Freak was too lazy to create a golf minigame, and the content was cut, leading to an awkward number of 7 island trials. Second, most of these trials are just plain lame and boring. Let's analyze all 7 of them. First trial is a small maze, but it's the first one, so fine. Second trial, you have to fish for Pokemon. Oh, but in designated spots, not like fishing for Phoebus in Route 119 in Pokemon Emerald. This is so lame, what a joke. Third trial, spot the difference puzzle for kindergartners and the average Fortnite player. How about we add Simon Says or Hangman while we're at it? Fourth trial, food ingredient hunting. Probably the one with the most brain thought required, so acceptable. But animating 3D models for food ingredients take too much effort. Fifth trial, screen blacks out and you have to do an audio guessing game. Wow, probably took like 10 minutes to code and it feels like I'm getting a medical ear exam not playing a fucking video game. 6th trial, mini Pokemon Snap ripoff. Not bad, probably the best one. 7th trial, you walk down a hallway and shadows jump at you. They were again so lazy that they copied the same concept in Sword and Shield. Was Game Freak afraid that the current kid generation who play on their smartphones won't be able to beat hard, well-crafted puzzles or mazes? That's why I give my kids Pokemon Sun and Moon. The fool! <laughs> Episode 3, Revenge of the Z-Moves. Let's also talk about the rewards of the island trial, Z-Crystals. Game Freak marketed this game heavily as the biggest and baddest new feature of Generation 7. Similar to Mega Evolution, you give Z-Crystals to Pokemon to hold, 
but instead of Mega Evolving, a Pokemon can use one super duper strong move in battle. Sort of like an ultimate in Overwatch or Smash Bros. I actually like this. The biggest problem with Mega Evolution was the limited amount of Pokemon that could use it. I'm sorry poor Flygon, but not with Z Crystals, every single Pokemon can use it. They still made some exclusive attacks, which is nice because I think it was handled pretty adequately and gave Z moves more of an identity. Oh, fuck me right in the air. However, Remember, every time you beat an Island Trial or Kahuna, you get a Z Crystal. But there are only 7 Island Trials and 4 Kahunas and 18 Pokemon types. Other than the 11, there are still 7 types remaining such as Ice, Bug, and Fairy. And you just find them in random spots or random NPCs like Miss come up with a trial just hand them out to you. That's not fair for the 7 types. Why could you design 7 more events or trials, Game Freak? Well, the answer is always the same, and that it's because they cut corners, either due to lack of time or laziness. I think I have the easiest job in the world, except maybe the employees of Game Freak. Just spam the words lazy, rushed, and cut corners when talking about Pokemon, and I'll be able to buy a single GameStop stock or dodge coin. Episode 4, a Mew Regional Form Z. Let's talk about my favorite Mew gimmick they added in the game, Regional Forms. Basically, we now have Alolan Pokemon with different types and looks. Alola Mug, Alolan Raichu, you get the idea. In real life, animals look different based on what part of the world they live, like bears. So it makes sense that Pokemon have regional forms too. It also gives Alola its own unique feel to it through world building with Pokemon forms, which was never really felt in the previous regions. But... I just don't know why they only gave the Kanto Pokemon regional forms, and all the rest of the 600 Pokemon got shafted down the toilet. It's like if they made Mega Evolution Generation 6, they just only made Mega Evolution for Kanto Pokemon. Like, do these people get sexual pleasure from referencing Kanto everywhere non-stop? <laughs> hey, do you remember Kanto? Do you remember Red and Blue? Do you remember Professor Oak? Do you remember Team Rocket? Do you remember Giovanni? Do you remember Mewtwo? Do you remember Charizard? Do you remember the three legendary birds? Red and blue. I showed up and I clapped! I clapped when I saw them too! I clapped because I know Kanto. I know what that is! Ugh. Thankfully, the concept was carried over to Galar in Sword and Shield. And thank god, we got non-Kanto regional forms such as Galarian Zigzagoon and Galarian Stunfisk. Now I'm hoping for Sinnoh and Firms because that will be an interesting new feature that could be added in the Diamond or Pro remix. But I don't have high hopes after watching the Diamond or Pro remix trailer. <laughs> Episode 5, The Map Design Strikes Back. This was the first generation to ditch the grid design of the previous games. Yeah, Generation 6 was in 3D, but in those games, in every places except Lumio City, it felt like you were still in a grid-like patent environment, but able to move diagonally. What the hell? I'm having an orgasm! In this generation, the grid design was finally gone, but we got realistically proportioned environments. But... I think somehow the world design feels more fake and less organic compared to Generation 1 to 6. Even though the graphics are much better, I don't get the same feeling of traveling through a dense forest like I did when going through Viridian Forest in Gen 3, when I go through a jungle in this game. It's a bit hard to explain, but I think the reason may be because everyone's so large compared to the environment, so everything feels cramped and claustrophobic. What's ironic is that Sword and Shield had the exact opposite problem, where in that game there are too many big empty open areas. And instead of the traditional world map from previous generations, we got a satellite view of the entire world. But because everything is right next to each other, Alola feels cramped? Like even though the building and people are all sized realistically, everything is right next to each other. It makes some things laughable, like the docks of Hee <laughs> Hee City and Kuni Kuni City are right next to each other. But you can't travel there unless you take a very long way around, leading to the map design feeling unnatural. These kinds of things were less distracting in the older games because everything was spread out. Bottom line, I think the realistically proportioned world graphics was way too grand for the small 3DS screen and limited hardware capabilities, leading to the world design feeling fake. I will say this though, at least the world design is better than Sword and Shield because there are some optional areas to explore like 10 Karatil, and it's not just a straight line from south to north. 
I'm just worried that the Legends Arceus game will follow Sword and Shield's footsteps and it's gonna be an empty open space of nothing with Pokemon just standing around like zombies. Anyways, that's my take on Alola's map in general. And before I start tackling more depressing matters, I would like to talk about rideable Pokemon here. So in this game, Game Freak got rid of HM moves and instead we got rideable Pokemon. Some people really like this, but some people really hate the fact that they got rid of HM moves, because HM moves are necessary evil that makes exploration fun, at least according to them. In my humble opinion, I think the rideable Pokemon was a nice addition. Sorry HM move followers, but after live streaming Pokemon Emerald Nuzlocke, I just can't stand for shitty moves that I can't get rid of like Rock Smash and Cut. I think having Taurus as the bike, Machamp as strength, Stoutland as the dancing machine, Lapras as surf, Charizard as fly felt natural. Granted, it would have been nice if these Pokemon were our Pokemon in our team, but it would have meant everyone was forced to catch a Taros and carry one around with them, which would have been even worse than HM moves. And thankfully, this concept was finally realized in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Another reason Let's Go is better than Sword and Shield. Anyways, that's about it for the map design and lack of HM moves. However, there's a bigger problem than the world design and that is... Episode 6, The Return of Holding My Hand. Stop holding my hand! <laughs> <laughs> I can't do a, a Ray impression. Stop taking my hand! Let's start talking about major flaws of this game, starting with the game's near obsessive hand holding. Good god, Shigeru Omori should never go on dates because this man has a bigger hand fetish than Tarantino's foot fetish. Cause the first 4 hours of this game is hand holding the game. These 4 hours has to be one of the most boring moments I've ever experienced while playing a video game. Maybe except playing Animal Crossing New Horizons on Nintendo Switch. How do I know it was 4 hours? Remember, I played this live in front of an audience and we didn't finish the tutorial until my second 3 hour stream. Alola is made of 4 islands and the first island is nothing but tutorials. 4 hours of learning how to battle, learning how to catch Pokemon, learning what the island trial is. This game literally forces you to go to school in a game. It's educational? I don't want to be educated. I want to wrap my brain. Look, Game Freak, I know this game might be a kid's first Pokemon game, but even I remember finding the Tichi TV in Fire Red and Leaf Green annoying when I played it as a kid. I hope Masuda and Oromori realizes young, brilliant, innocent kids don't like to follow the rules. They don't like it when everything is laid out for them. They like to experiment and figure things out by themselves. That is why games with big open maps like Fortnite and creative games like Minecraft are popular among kids. You know, some modern video games are 4 hours long. And Game Freak broke Mew ground by having the fucking tutorial be 4 hours long. It's just so hours. I've had so many people comment on how they quit playing this game after the first 2 hours because of how boring it was, and I understand them. Thankfully, the game starts to get more fun and we get more freedom after leaving the first island. But let's talk about the Rotom Dex map that shows up on the bottom screen. Now we have objective points of the map telling you where to go. I really do not like this. Call me a video game boomer, but giving directions on the map makes an already linear game feel more linear. I just want to say, you are underestimating the gamers who stuck with you for 20 years, Game Freak, and you are also underestimating the intelligence of the kids who play these games too. Please, give us some freedom. Trust the gamer. Okay, I think we are ready to finally talk about things that may be mad and disappointed for real, so prepare yourself for some real shitstorm. Episode 7, The Motherfucking Story and Cutscenes Awaken. え、その、ま、例えばサムーンですと結構ストーリー性みたいなものをその今までのシリーズと比べるとえっと入れてきたかなと思ってます。これはそういったものでま、表現できるストーリーもあるんじゃないかっていうことを思ってストーリーをま、
I actually do like the story of Sun and Moon, and it's because it's, it's about, about family, family. And, and that's, that's what's, what's so powerful, powerful about, about it. it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not pulling your leg. Ever since Ruby and Sapphire, we've gotten evil bad guys messing around with regional DLT legendary Pokemon either because they want to rule the world or destroy it. Black and White was the first game to ditch it, but the sequel went back to Mr. Guess's trying to freeze Unova because, um... Wait, why did he want to freeze Unoba again? Anyways, after the ridiculous over-the-top cheese villain Lissandre in X and Y, This world is imperfect. We finally got a Pokemon villain that wasn't a maniac trying to destroy or take over the world. We have the first female Pokemon villain, Luzamine. Nice. And I really like her. I find her a compelling villain. A crazy mother, leader of a white-themed BDSM sex cult who went insane after losing her husband is a very interesting character trait. I also like how the story was trying not to save the world from Sogaleo and Lunala, but more about bringing peace to Lilie, Gladion, and Luzamine's family. I also like that Luzanima didn't realize she was wrong in the end, but just goes into a coma. And the story leaves room for a sequel. <sighs> Anyways, the story of Sun and Moon was not bad. But what was the problem? The damn stupid cutscenes. There are just too many goddamn cutscenes in this game. To compare with Black and White, I liked how in that game the text scrolls by really fucking fast and you can just spam A, essentially giving the player the option to skip the story. But here? Because all the cutscenes are animated, and very awkwardly I might add, you have to sit through all of it. They went really overboard with the cutscenes, and you can tell from the ending. Other games, you beat the champion and that moment, you're done, right? No, in this game, it literally took me 31 minutes and 4 seconds for me to reach the end screen after beating the Pokemon League. Wait, there's more end credits? Yeah, this game's like, the ending is like 50 minutes long. Oh my god, you can't even save, like, imagine like if you exit out of the screen here. Oh my god, shut up! What's this? Oh my god, just continue. Fuck. Shut up, shut up, shut up. It's still going, like this game is worse than Lord of the Rings Return of the King Extended Cut. Uh, still going. Oh, there's the fucker Shigeru Omori. Fuck you. <laughs> Shut up, let's get to the fucking the end screen, like... The end, finally. This Saving, finally. God damn it. Uh, if you watch Masuda and Omori interviews about Sun and Moon, you can tell they're really fucking proud of the fact that you get to enjoy a visual 3D story in this game. And that just makes me want to go strangle someone. What's worse is that the player has the eyes of Mark Zuckerberg. Like, BLINK MOTHERFUCKER! I believe I said in a previous video, some things that are acceptable in 2D are not acceptable in 3D. For example, a sprite standing still during a cutscene in the overworld is fine. But we imagine in our minds that the characters are expressing something. But in a 3D realistic environment, it's awkward as hell when characters are just standing still while they talk, and swivel around like they're stuck in 2D, and just screams, we are too lazy to animate good cutscenes. So in conclusion, please cut down the fucking cutscenes and try to make the characters actually act like they belong in a 3D environment. Episode 8, The Last Lilie. No, fuck it, just Episode 8, Lilie. I need to talk about my biggest gripe with this game, and that is Lilie. Most of people's gripes might be the overextent cutscenes, but I see the character of Lilie as a bigger problem. No kidding. Why? First, let's talk about the history. Ever since Black and White, Game Freak has been pushing one character for the story in a game. What is this one character? It's a character in a Pokemon game that the story's narrative will be about, not you. In Black and White, it was N. In X and Y, it was AZ. In Oras, it was Zinnia. And now in this game we have Lilie, and she bugs the hell out of me, because, unlike the previously mentioned characters, she is the main character of the story, not you. And the main character is just sidelined to watch. It's her mother that's the villain, it's her shouting at her mother that's the climax of the story, it's her posing with Lunala as the final photo in the credits. Lilie is the main character in the narrative of this game. Compared with the previous games, it's like as if in Oras you watch Xenia go into space and fight the Oxes, and you just sit on Sky Pillar on your ass and watch it happen. Or it's like if you're playing The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, you don't play as Geralt of Rivia as the main character, but you play as Dandelion, the comedic bard character. No, wait, at least Dandelion has a personality. The main character in this game is an emotionless robot. It's like playing Super Mario 64, but you play as Lakitu that follows around Mario. Literally a fucking camera. The reason why I don't like this kind of storytelling is for one big reason, and that is, 
Why can't we, the player, play as Lilie? Imagine if we were able to control Lilie. It will be satisfying watching her go through a character arc. We see her go from being a shy, timid girl, to becoming a real Pokemon trainer, to confronting and then saving her mother, and becoming Alola's first Pokemon champion, completing a character-driven narrative. Oh, but you say, silent protagonists are traditional in Nintendo games, including Pokemon. Well, let's compare that to Link in Breath of the Wild. Even though Princess Zelda was a prominent character with probably the most character development in the game, the game was not about Zelda's story in the end. It's about you, Link the hero, bringing peace to Hyrule by surviving in the wilderness, defeating Calamity Ganon, and rescuing Princess Zelda. If Breath of the Wild has Sun and Moon storytelling, we will be controlling Link and Zelda does all the hard work by confronting Ganon in the story and gets credit, while we watch behind with a blank stare. What's more depressing for me is that you can't even battle Lilie. We never see her use Pokemon. What is the purpose of a character in a Pokemon game if she isn't a trainer? To me, and due to the awkward animation of this game, she just a text generator bot that walks around with you during the game. Remember Wally in Oras? We actually witnessed him go through a character development naturally through game mechanics because he was a weak trainer at the start, but became a formidable opponent at the end of the game. If Lilia turned into a trainer after changing clothes, wouldn't it have been satisfying to see her turn into a formidable boss battle? But no, and I'm not kidding here, her big moment is, she managed to cross the bridge. Whoopity fucking do. Bottom line, sidelining your main protagonist by making her into an emotionless terminator and being forced to watch a different person's story is not fun, and... If it's not fun, why bother? Episode 9, The Rise of Incomplete. I'm gonna end the video by complaining about another big problem of this game, and that is the game feels unfinished. First, the last island, Pony Island, feels incomplete. The trial on that island is a dumb hallway like I mentioned, and the Kahuna battle feels out of place. It's also the place where Mina shows up and just hands you the Z-Crystal. It's like they ran out of time after finishing the first three islands and rushed through it. Second, there are places that are on the map but don't have a purpose, like the golf course I mentioned a couple times. Another example is the completely empty victory row without any trainers. There is even a berry field that is just there for decoration. You know, I'm one of the few people that enjoyed berry farming in X and Y, and couldn't they just copy and paste it from that? Third, the Zygarde storyline is stupid as hell and a lot of missed potential. What we got was basically the Korok seeds from Breath of the Wild. Ugh, I don't think this is a special treatment, but a slap in the face to 100% completionist Game Freak. Fourth, there were story elements that went unresolved, like why do the Ultra Beasts resemble humans? Also, there are these empty slots in every city for Alola, which have no purpose in the game. What I'm trying to say is, there was so much room for potential and sequel to this game, and since the ending of the story left room for a sequel, and since this game was so similar to Black and White, I was expecting that we got another awesome game like Black and White 2 set in Alola. It was the end of the 3DS's lifespan in 2017, so I expected Game Freak will make the ultimate 3DS Pokemon game. And... Uh, Never have I been more wrong in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also I realized that I didn't mention the online features like the Festival Plaza, the Battle Tower, I mean Tree, WHERE THE HELL IS IT?! and Poke Pelago, or the competitive battle scene. Ah, fuck it, only insane people give a damn. Okay, I've been getting so many comments about yesterday's video about these two blonde individuals whose names start with L's. Why do you say Lily like that? It's adorable how you pronounce Lily. I don't know if this is some gimmick of this channel, but the mispronunciation of Lusamine and Lily's name was very irritating. It's Lily -E and Lusamine. So apparently their correct way to pronounce is Lily and Lusamine. And I pronounced the video as Lilie, Lilie, and Luzamine, Luzamine. Now, I have some excuses and spoilers, it's not my fault, it's you English-speaking people. First, I've never watched a Pokemon anime because I'm a grown man, so I've only read the text of these people's names in the games, so I can only guess what their official pronunciation are. Second, has anyone met a person in real life named Lily and Luzamine? Spelled the way it is, Microsoft Word even calls Luzamine a fake word, so it's a made up name. Therefore, it can be pronounced Luza Minecraft or Suz Post Blah as far as I care. Third, unlike popular belief, I'm not a fat hamburger munching, oil stealing American. I'm a pure Korean. I'm more used to their Korean names, and these people's names in Korean are. Lilie. 
Mutamine. Why is the official Korean name like these, you may ask? Well, the Japanese names are. Let's copy and paste from Bobapedia. Yeah, so the English translation is wrong. Fourth, ignoring Lily's official pronunciation. Why is Lily then spelled with an extra L I E when there is already a common English word that is pronounced the exact same way, that being Lily with a Y? Let's try to Google Lily with the L I E to figure out the name origins. Then what's the fucking point? Lastly, Luzamin is apparently an Estonian word according to Google Translate and it's pronounced Luzamina. Also, according to Bobopedia, Lily and Luzamin is named after German words. And listen. Lily, Luzamina. So in conclusion, English is a stupid language, the official names are stupid, and you are stupid only because I'm right, and you're always wrong. Now, as a Korean, let me get back to pronouncing Leshilamu, Chekromu, and Pokemon Trainer Green. Wait, what? Pokemon has changed. It's no longer about content, passion, or effort. It's an endless series of mundane battles fought by drones and sheeps. Pokemon and its consumption of money has become a wild old machine. Pokemon has changed. ID Tag fans buy ID Tag DLCs, use ID Tag mobile games. Nostalgia in their bodies enhances and regulates their cash flow. Pokedex control, online control, animation control, wallet control. Everything is monitored and kept under control. Pokemon has changed. The age of abundance has become the age of laziness. All in the name of making money from fans of mass consumption. And he who controls the franchise controls history. Pokemon has changed. When the remakes are under total control, Pokemon becomes routine. Kirim. From that overly pretentious, terribly voice acted opening, you can probably tell what my stance on the Pokemon franchise these days is. Rushed, lazy, cutting corners, just trying to make money off nostalgic fans with mediocre games, Pokemon games aren't what they originally were. If you ask any sane real Pokemon fan, where do you think the franchise started to go downhill? Most will either answer with Sword and Shield because of obvious reasons, or X and Y since Pokemon started to suck when it became 3D. I, however, disagree. They at least tried with Generation 6 and Sun and Moon. And while I might call these games rushed or incomplete, they didn't feel lazy. No, the moment the franchise started to go downhill was Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, the final mainline games for the 3DS. They just didn't start caring starting with this game. No one will know if it is right or wrong! No one will care! If you watched my previous Pokemon videos, I didn't hide the fact that I am not really in love with these games. In fact, I have been subtly building up to this review. There are things I didn't mention in the video, like how Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is somehow worse than Sun and Moon. If it only satisfies one, it's mediocre or bad. If it doesn't satisfy all of them, it's a stinker. Because talking about Platinum made me remember how much I despise these games. Yeah, I don't like these games. Now before I explain to you viewers, let me clarify some things. First, if I've never played Pokemon Sun and Moon and just played these Ultra games, I probably have liked them. 
The main problems are failing to improve and straight up worse than Sun and Moon when compared to the original games, not really the games themselves. Second, I admit that Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is a better made game in quotation marks compared to Sword and Shield, since A, it has more content, B, it's not a cakewalk, and C, the graphics are better, and D, it has all Pokemons. However, I prefer Sword and Shield over Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon because Gen 8 at least had original stuff like new region, characters, Pokemon, and actually some creativity. USGM on the other hand feels like almost a practical joke because I felt scammed getting an inferior copy of existing games from Game Freak and I felt dirty playing these. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that USUM are not the worst Pokemon games per se, no, but to me, USUM is the most disappointing games in the entire series. See, I pulled a sneaky on you. So, you're gonna hear me focus on and talk about wasted potentials, the laziness of trying to enhance these games, and places where the game actually got worse than Sun and Moon somehow. This is straight up review of Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, on why it failed, and how it was the start of a download slope of the Pokemon series. Part 1, What I Expected Before I review the actual game, I want to tell you guys what I was expecting for these games first, so maybe you can guys can grasp why I'm so pissy at these games. These games in many ways are very similar to the Pokemon games Pokemon Black and White 2, probably the best Pokemon games. Both pairs are the final games on a Hell and Hell console, where there are two generations on, and they both are sequels to games where story was a big focus. Both predecessor strengths were the memorable characters in the story, and both left some loose ends in the story for a sequel. What I mean is that there was a lot of potential for a sequel to Sun and Moon, and we should have gotten a Sun and Moon 2 in my opinion. Let's think about this. The previous games were special because they were the first games to ditch the gym leader system, and you were the first challenger and champion of the Pokemon League. Let's say the sequel was set 2 years later, like Black and White 2. You could have gotten a whole brand new gym system for Alola in the last 2 years. Most of the island captains like Malo and Asarola are young kids, so it would have been nice to see them grow up and become gym leaders of Alola. Do you see the missed potential? I'm just saying it would have been nice to see how become a gym leader or Kahuna like his grandfather, or your boy Guzma fixes up his act and becomes a gym leader. Instead we got... <sighs> I'll talk about this more late in the video. Also, let's talk about the ending of the previous game. It ended with Lilie. 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 Living to Kanto to hear her catatonic mother. Wouldn't it have been nice to see her return with her mother after 2 years to Alola? There would have been a good story potential and would have given a nice opportunity for a redemption arc for Lily's mother. Instead we got... <sighs> Are you beginning to understand why I'm disappointed? I'll talk about her too. Some of you might say my expectations were too high. I'm being relative and comparing to good games like Black and White 2 because I'm a nostalgic fanboy. Well, I have no shame saying that I want another game that's the level of Black and White 2. It's like telling me to get a shame from saying I want a good Pokemon game. So, call me crazy, but I think that my expectations were justified. I can't believe I have to say this every time like other YouTubers, but I'm just here to express my opinion. Anyways, as you can guess, my expectations were high and I was fully expecting a Sun and Moon 2, but Game Freak decided to go the route of the third version. And let's talk about that. Part 2 Third version splitting Pokemon games in two, and the goddamn name. Game Freak have been making third games ever since Generation 1 of Pokemon. We've had Pokemon Yellow, Crystal, Emerald, and the Platinum. In Generation 5, they changed it up with a sequel instead. Some may find Game Freak making a third copy of a video game when there's already two for full price scummy, and I do understand that sentiment, but I disagree. Third games are better than DLCs and season passes when done right. I don't mind paying for the game another time when I know that I'm going to be playing a game that'll be one of the best games in the series. Call me a sucker, but historically, third games before USGM has always been considered the best games in the Pokemon series, and why is that? First, it fixes almost every problem that the previous games had. Even though extra content is good, third games aren't just about the new content they have added. I said it before, but Pokemon Diamond and Pearl are terrible games. Slow ass buggy game engine, small Pokedex because Masuda is a fucking Gen 1-er that is obsessed with the number 151. Mediocre story? It was Platinum that elevated Sinnoh into the worship status it currently is. 
Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire almost felt like tech demos for the Game Boy Advance. And it was Emerald that made people go, Cohen confirmed, hashtag Cohen confirmed in 2013. All of the main two games that start generations felt incompleted or needed something more, and it was the sort of games that finished those games. Second, the story is different enough and there is new content enough that it doesn't feel repetitive playing the same game again. Platinum is the best example because of whole Giratina storyline and story changes like the Distortion World. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon though, the whole Ultra Recon Squad and Necrozma story doesn't make me go, Oh yes daddy, oh Mori, I'm ready, I'll buy these games again. We'll talk more about the atrocious story of the game in detail later. Third, the previous third games felt like ultimate final games that combined the two previous games into one ultimate package. For example, you could fight only Team Magma and Aqua, Groudon and Kyogre respectively in Ruby and Sapphire. In Emerald, you fight all of them in the same game, plus a third force of power that plays, which is Rayquaza. How awesome was that? Third games are like the marriage of two games and an actual ultimate version. But USUM is not one ultimate ultra fucking game like the name suggests, but two games. It's not combining the story of Sun and Moon together, just slightly enhancing two games. Previously, the reason why Game Freak made two games is because number one, money, and number two, it's to encourage people trading Pokemon between games. But this is an ultimate final third game. There is no reason to split these two games other than trying to make money off of people who buy Double Pass because they're brain dead or sexually insane. I get this question all the time. I want to try out Generation 7 of Pokemon, but which one should I play, Girim? The original Sun and Moon or the Ultra games? Well, it's really hard to recommend which games to choose because even though USUM has more content, SM was the better experience for me. It's funny because if you've only played Pokemon Diamond, I would highly suggest trying out Pokemon Platinum because it'll be an enjoyable experience. Or played only Sapphire? Try Emerald. But Generation 7 on the other hand? Pick your poison, motherfucker. Also, the name of these games too. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. More like ultra fucking shit. That is probably the most cliche, unimaginative, stale name for a game that I've ever heard. Well, maybe except New Super Mario Bros. series. Game Freak literally had the creativity of smartphone manufacturers naming USUM. Like, was the Samsung Galaxy Note series a good influence for a video game series? I guess I'll expect a Pokemon Pro Sword and Pro Shield, or Pokemon Legends Arceus SC in the future. Gosh, we haven't talked about the games yet, and just the name feels like a money laundering scheme. Bottom line, if they're going to make third versions, instead of making two fucking games, they should have made one game with a good title like Pokemon Prism Eclipse or something, and made it the quality of the previous third versions. Part 3 Actual Positives But before we ridicule the game, I will talk about the positives first. Um... The Mew remixes of the songs are good. Hey! Wanna listen to some tunes? Part 4, the biggest- Okay, for real though, there are some actual big positives to this game. Most of the positives I mentioned in Sun and Moon are still in this game. The decent graphics for the 30s, the visual aesthetic of Alola, the music, and the wonderful memorable new characters are all still there. There were a lot of quality life improvements as well. First, there's the bigger Pokedex. I'm always for more diverse Pokemon because having options is fun. Also, their previous game had a problem where you can't evolve some Pokemon until very late in the game, but they fixed it here, so you can actually use Pokemon like Magnezone and Vikabolt in this game. And there is one character that did benefit from the story of this game, and that is Hao. Hao kind of got sidelined by the end of the story in the original games, but they gave him more of a completed character arc. Cheery guy that is secretly afraid that he can't live up to his grandfather's name, I dig it, it's much better than his Galarian form. Also, him being the final boss was a nice change. It was better than having some random gym leader from the previous games becoming a champion for some reason, and that is one factor of Pokemon Emerald and Black and White 2 that I admit is really bad. Probably the biggest improvement is the late game, because Game Freak ran out of time making Sun and Moon. Alola is made up of four islands, and Pony Island, the fourth island, felt incomplete and empty. This game, the island actually feels complete. Also, the victory road in the last game was completely empty because they didn't have time to program trainers. What? Now, victory road in this game actually feels like victory road with the nice music and everything. That's about it. All of these are nice additions, but do they really warrant two new games? No, 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 no,
No! All of these changes are patches they could have distributed via download as free DLCs to be honest. Which leads into my next point. Part 4, The Biggest Problem. Unlike my Sun and Moon review, I'll start talking about the biggest problem with this game, and ironically, it's the least to talk about. The biggest problem of this game is not the stupid changes or additions that I will rant about later in the video. No, it's the fact that this game is just a carbon copy of Sun and Moon. That's the reason why I made my character dress up in default Sun and Moon clothes in this game, because it would make Zack Snyder cry in shame for hand-fisted symbolism. So don't get confused, the footage of Stellene wearing the ridiculous rubber hat like the penguin from Wallace and Gromit is from USUM, not Sun and Moon. The catchphrase of USUM that was in the trailers was, This isn't the Alola you thought you knew. LIAR! Well Game Freak's marketing department, you son of a gun, you are either trolling or just fucking with us. Cause the Alola region in this game is exactly like the one I thought I knew. <laughs> Let's return to the map of Alola. Except for some new features on the first island and the improved final island Ponya Island, the middle islands are nearly identical. You still have the same routes, same trials, same events, the same cutscenes, and everything. And considering how many fucking cutscenes are in this game, it really tries your patience rewatching every same awkward anime turns from the last game. And that's why my attitude is so negative toward this game. I felt like I got scanned by Game Freak. I just bought Sun and Moon again full price with useless features added in, with some that actually worsen the game. You know, people that buy a game on a console that is almost dead when there's a new console that was just released are probably the most dedicated fans, and you just have to milk those fans who stuck by you dry, right Game Freak? We've got to have money. And that's why I don't like USUM. They were boring and not fun. This game came out exactly one year after the original Sun and Moon, and I can't believe this game even exists to be honest. Why did this happen? Why am I talking about this game, let alone being a YouTuber when my life probably had other plans for me? Why am I talking to a microphone right now? Part 5. Things they didn't fix. Like I said, the point of third version is fixing problems and things that didn't work in the previous installment. Now I'm gonna talk about the things they didn't fix. First, minor stuff. There was a berry field in Sun and Moon that was literally for decoration because they didn't have time to code berry growing mechanics despite having one in X and Y. So in this game, they fixed it, right? Wrong. The berry field is still a useless part of the map. If there is something that doesn't lead to anywhere and is pointless to the game, just cut that content out. Ray! Ray! Ray, I never told you Ray! What? Second, Kahili the Elite 4 is still a trial captain. They still didn't bother to add the golf course that only existed on the Atlas of the world map. Have golf themed trainers, golf themed Atlas map, golf themed character, but still no golf. If this game wasn't trying to be a sequel, how about adding more fucking trials so every type has a trial, so that flying and ice don't get shafted? Third, the vast pony cannon trial is still a fucking joke. You still walk down a hallway and shadows jump at you. I guess there's a contract for Game Freak developers that they need to add at least one boring hallway section in the game, so prepare to see this in Legends Arceus. Fifth, the character is still an emotionless robot during cutscenes. No feelings, just blankly staring at everything. You're a monster. Monster. And you just stare at me like that, you don't say anything. Then you go in that closet and I hear buttons being pushed and you talking in an alien voice. Who are you talking to? You don't seem human to me! I think real life serial killers like Ted Bundy had more emotions than the main protagonist in this game. Is USUM the world Cyrus was talking about in the Gen 4 games? A world without emotions? I'm gonna go with Occam's Razor and guess that Game Freak probably didn't fix this problem because they copy and pasted the exact same cutscenes from Sun and Moon for this game. It's because they were, say with me children, rushed, lazy, and cut corners. What's funny is that I was watching past clips of gameplay of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire and take a look at this fellow Jerry Cans. Oh my god! I guess Game Freak is following the strategy of two steps back every installment so that games we thought that were crap when it came out would look good in the future. It is evolving just backwards. I bet you there will be things in Sword and Shield we'll look back fondly five years from now at this rate, but hey, at least they gave us clothes. At least there were no microtransactions and loot boxes in Sword and Shield. At least we had a new region that was in Kanto. <laughs> I guess the story moment that can be used to summarize USUM in a nutshell is the second visit to Aether Paradise. Same cutscenes with Dick Wick, same three battles in a row because we took out triple battles in Generation 7, same awkward lines by Faba. 
Hey Game Freak, remember the basement of Aerithor Paradise? This underground hub where the elevator is was clearly designed to have three doors that lead to different laboratories, but in the original games they ran out of time and had only one door open. It's exactly the same in this game too. How about instead of adding useless shit in the game, try fixing these kind of places by having all those closed doors lead somewhere. Here's a good idea. Have a point. God, this game is the worst thing that happened to humanity since Elon Musk. Part 6. Somehow more hand-holding. Looking back at my Sun and Moon review and after playing near identical Alola again, I think I should have emphasized more on the over-excessive hand-holding, tutorials, and cutscenes of the Gen 7 games. I kind of glossed over it and I regret that because it's still a damn problem here. The biggest thing they didn't fix and they should have fixed are the fucking tutorials, hand-holding, and the overuse of cutscenes. I'll talk more about this later, but what's ironic is that this game is probably one of the most difficult Pokemon games of all time. It was meant for <coughs> seasoned players. I don't know if the developers were high or insane or both because the difficulty of this game is paradoxical to the amount of hand-holding and tutorials of these games. Like, how is the Ultra Necrozma fight in the same game as tutorials like these? Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. I don't care about the tutorials. This game difficulty was for people who played Pokemon Sun and Moon. Why is the game holding my hand? People who play this game are probably Sun and Moon people. Come on, it took me weeks to get tickets for this show. It's Shway. It's Schwarbage. And if you haven't played the game, you won't believe this. I swear I'm not pulling your leg, fucking with you, joking around, lying, kidding, or being false. They've actually added more tutorials to this game from the base Sun and Moon. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. There are more cussings in this game. <laughs> You're laughing. You're laughing. The reason there are more tutorials in this game is quite simple, and it's something I realized while playing Alola for the second time. It's because every single Arceus Dam feature and gimmick has a lazily animated scripted cutscene that goes on forever that brings the game to a screeching halt. No, no, you're still holding on! Let go! And since this game has the tutorials of the original Sun and Moon plus the tutorials for the new features in USUM, there are more tutorials in the end. Tutorials like how to catch Pokemon, what the Pokemon Center does, how to ride Pokemon, how to use the camera, what the island trial is, how to surf. Hey Game Freak, most of your fucking game involves two buttons, A for yes and B for no. Was this necessary? Oh, but we have more tutorials for the few features such as how to use the Alola Photo Club, how to surf on Mantine, how to do the Ultra Wormhole. And unlike the original game, the game forces you to check out the online feature which is the Festival Plaza. Online features. And even the cutscenes take like 5 minutes to get through and you can't even save during it. Was this game developed by Ubisoft? Is Omori gonna ask me to subscribe to Uplay? Are these guys sadists? It's like in Breath of the Wild, every time you enter an area, you are constantly greeted by a shitty cutscene to show you how a useless feature works. Link, this is how you use a spear. Watch as I do a half-ass animation with a spear while saying which button to press. Link, if you want to eat food, you better watch me take 5 minutes to catch this wild bear with an arrow. Pick up the meat, gather berries from the trees, cook it in a fire, pull up the menu and eat it. What makes good games like Zelda good is it gives the player the freedom to play around with the simple controls while being very in-depth with skills to master with a high skill ceiling. What makes bad games like USUM shitty is making it fucking boring by holding our hands like a creep, ruining the pace of the game, and not giving us freedom. Gamers, and that includes children by the way, aren't idiots. Please Game Freak, trust us to figure out things by ourselves. Part 7. Minor dumb shit no one asks for. In the Let's Go Games video, I did a burger analogy with Gordon Ramsay, so let's do the same here. Pokemon Sun and Moon was a decent burger, but there were ingredients missing like the tomato and the sauce, because the chef was trying to rush out dishes into the kitchen because they have to meet the holiday quota. We were dissatisfied, but wanted more after eating the Sun and Moon burger. Then Chef Game Freak, instead of giving us an enhanced burger with new sauce and extra meaty ingredient, decided to give us the exact same burger plate, but since they couldn't serve us the exact same burger, they threw random shit into the burger that don't go along, like chocolate, bitter almonds, chocolate chip cookies, candy sticks, mouth fresheners. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is exactly this disgusting fucking burger. 
Yeah, the game has technically more content than Base Sun and Moon, similar to how this burger technically has more ingredients. But do you really want to eat this thing? I didn't ask you to get crazy, I just wanted you to cook what was on your back. Let's start out easy with minor dumb shit no one asked for. The first is Pikachu Valley. What is there to say about this? It's just a small area on the map with a bunch of Pikachu in it. I was there for like 2 minutes in real time and moved on and never came back. Instead of creating useless areas like this, how about fixing that berry field next door? There's also the Alola Photo Club. You can now take photos by posing with Pokemon and share them online. Not bad on paper, but first, the 3DS online system was somehow worse than the Switch one. Second, Gen 7 online UI is about as bad as YouTube. Third, you couldn't share these on social media sites easily like Twitter, so what's the point? Fourth, the poses look dumb. Another dumb shit is totem stickers. I guess they understood how people didn't like the downgraded legendary Pokemon Zygarde into Korok seized in the previous game, so instead they just put stickers all over the map, and stickers don't go along well with Nintendo games, so who cares. Also, there's the Rotom Dex. In the previous game, the Rotom Dex on the bottom screen was just a cheeky map UI that said some clever comments after cutscenes. However, in this game, this thing is constantly talking to you with stupid questions and answers, tries you to try out new features, and won't shut up when you're just trying to look at the map when trying to figure out where the fuck to go. I guess Omori accidentally downloaded the wrong app while browsing Pornhub or something, and his Google Maps got hacked with advertisements, and decided to recreate that experience in the game. Let's also talk extensively about Manta Surfing. Who the hell asked for this? A surfing game with the controls about as fluent as a mobile game? If I wanted to do surfing challenges in a game, I would have bought a sports games like Wii Sports Resort or something, not played in a Pokemon game. This game mode is so detached from the main game, since it really has nothing to do with Pokemon. It could have been literally a mode in Pilot Wings 3D. I can only think of one reason they added in this game, and that is, when the original Sun and Moon came out, people were like, um, this is Hawaii, right? Why can't we surf and travel between islands on Pokemon? And the game frame was like, oh shit, and decided to put a mini game in. And instead of designing new maps and ocean routes that connect the islands, Game Freak again cut corners and just came up with a shitty gimmick to compensate for that. However, ironically, I believe this is the part of the game where the most effort went into, because they had to come up with a new control system, come up with a new model and physics, and to be less cynical, it really is just a harmless mini-game and I've heard people that did genuinely enjoy it, this part of the game, so whatever. It's an addition that I really don't mind. It just doesn't make the game experience worse or anything. But, I only played this game once when the game forced me to play it at the start, so that's time and effort wasted. Let's compare it to the Eon Flute from Oras, which is a bit similar. I prefer flying on Latios and Latias over this because it was awesome seeing the entire Hoenn region from the air, but Mantine Surfing is just surfing on blue featureless ocean with zero exploration, and Eon Flute had the practicality of being able to fly to areas without needing a Pokemon that mute the HM move fly. But the only sole purpose of surfing on Manta is for farming BP, which should have been for the fucking Battle Frontier. Where is it? Anyways, all the features I set up to now were just harmless but kind of pointless additions to the base Sun and Moon. Might have been a waste of effort on Game Freak's part, but whatever. Now let's talk about major additions in this so-called Ultra game that really pisses me the fuck off and stuff that actually harmed the game, starting with Part 8. Fuck Kanto. STOP POSTING ABOUT Kanto. I'M TIRED OF SEEING IT! Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Kanto the Wilds? That's my secret, Cat. I'm always- Kanto. The Kanto region can go fuck itself. I seriously hate Kanto now after playing this game. And keep in mind, this is coming from the guy that made a video detailing why Let's Go Fucking Pikachu and Eevee are great games. And it's because the Kanto references, homages, and parodies are just out of control in this game. Referencing previous games aren't bad, but this is just too much. I remember when Sword and Shield was first released, people were pissy because the champion had a Charizard as his ace. People were really getting tired of Generation 1 and Kanto pandering, and I think USUM was the game it first started to get out of control. Like, I think the developers of Game Freak are sexually frustrated with the region that is Kanto or something. I bet this plays in Masuda's head every time before he goes to sleep. Hey guys, did you know that in terms of gameplay and story, Kanto is the most enjoyable region for exploration? Not only does it have roots, which is mostly comprised of plant forests and plains, Kanto has an average of 8 gyms and 10 cities. 
this means they're large enough to be able to handle any Pokemon player and with the impressive dungeons for Zubat and Nessus to Geodos, you can be fun with it! There was already enough Gen 1 pandering from the previous game like the main protagonist being from Kanto, Red and Blue showing up, Lily going off to Kanto in the end, only the Kanto Pokemon getting region forms, but in this game, they thought that was enough, so they went overboard. For example, they recreated the classic Nugget Bridge on Route 24 north of Cerulean City at Mali City Garden. This is equivalent to the You'll Be Dead guy's cameo in Rogue One. Like, was this necessary? Having to battle trainers of Caterpies and Zubats caused Gen 1. You know, I thought this whole city and garden thing was based off the Johto region because the tower is in the park, but Game Freak only remembers Kanto. But the most offensive of all was the Cantonian gym in Mali City. Ah, uh, the gym system. <sighs> I mentioned in the beginning of the wasted potential of these games not being a sequel. Well, sequel or not, they could have at least made the game fresh by adding a gym system into the game since it was absent in SM. Also in the previous game, all cities of Alola had empty lots with construction materials lying around, implying that buildings, most likely gyms, were gonna be made in the sequel. So in USUM, these empty lots and cities have a purpose, right Game Freak? You added gyms to these ULTRA games, right? No. No, I don't think I will. Nah, only one building was erected at Mali City. And we got this piece of crap called Cantonian Gym instead. Hey kids, do you remember Vermilion City Gym? Do you remember opening trash cans? Yes. 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 When I first entered this place, I thought this was an out of season April Fool's joke or something. Like, do I have to explain why this is dumb? We sacrificed proper Alolan gyms for this? I don't think I would have been this mad at this if we got cameos from actual Kanto gym leaders like Lieutenant Surge, but that requires modeling characters which is work. Instead we have generic trainers and another trial captain reject like Kahili as the leader. To me, this gym is the equivalent of the Battle Frontier model they had in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, teasing our cocks like the idiots we are for buying Game Freak's crappy games. Slimmer to how they knew we wanted a Battle Frontier but didn't give it to us, they knew we wanted a proper gym in Alola, but they gave us the middle finger instead by having having a fake gym pandering to nostalgia with minimum effort. <sighs> Remember in Black and White 2 when they brought back all gym leaders to wrap up 5 generations before going 3D? I miss those days. Nowadays, even properly well done fan service is reserved for fucking gacha games because we have to make money. We're in the money. The sky is sunny. Part 9 Ultra Necrozma Let's start properly talking about the horrendous story of this game, starting with our title mascot. It's my belief these games were designed to piss Pokemon fans off or drive them nuts. It's only a matter of time now. A few more minutes and millions of people are going to go... Like we've established, this game is a 40 hour long tutorial. But this game is probably one of the most difficult Pokemon games ever with probably the spikiest difficulty curve. I don't mind steep difficulty curves, but I mind when the difficulty curve is fucking stairs. And it's all because of you, the best sidekick a homicidal maniac ever had. This game is filled with weird difficulty spikes such as the principal at the start that pulls out the opposite type starter out of nowhere, or Ilima's Smeargle that knows moves that can kill your starter easily. But the dumbest fight is the Ultra Necrozma fight. Fans of this game talk about how much they love this part of the game, why it's the best thing in the world since the invention of air fryers, but no. This part sucks. For those who don't know, I'll explain. At the final island, there's a moment in the story where you have to fight Ultra Necrozma, the Barksart Pokemon. Its level is at 60, when my Pokemon's party's level average was at early level 50s. By the way, the average level of the Alola and Elite 4, which takes place way after this, is 56, and the Champion House level is 58 to 60. If you don't get it, it means this is just a failure at progressive level difficulty design. Also, all of its stats are raised, meaning most of your Pokemon will get one-shotted by this thing. Look, having tough bosses is not a bad idea. It's rewarding when you overcome a tough boss, but a tough boss needs to be at the summit of a gradual slope of difficulty. The Ultra Necrozma fight comes out of nowhere, and it's not a tough fight, but it's an unfair fight. When the only way to beat this thing is to cheat, or be like Dream. Yeah, I guess that is the same thing. By using strategy like fooling Necrozma with a Zoroark, or stalling with Toxic, it's bad gameplay design. 
What's worse is that this fight is not optional, but a boss fight you have to beat to progress through the story. If this was a side quest or post game, sort of like Mewtwo in the original Kanto games, I would understand. But no, Ultra Necrozma is a fight where you have to beat to progress. And Game Freak keeps mentioning about how they want this game to be approachable for kids that love smartphones? Are these people delusional? And in this age with so many games to choose from, we thought that we'd rather make something that was easier to progress through, and kind of tailor that playstyle to how we think that the playstyle has evolved over the years and how children are playing games now. Let's also talk about the concept of Necrozma and how unoriginal it is. At least Sword and Shield's Dynamaxing with Eternatus was original. Necrozma in USGM is just a ripoff of Kirin from Black and White 2, fusing with Sogaleo and Ulana to create new form. Even Korra shows up to mention the similarities. And the special gimmick that Ultra Necrozma does, which is changing into an Ultra Mega Uber form in battle, is just a ripoff of Mega Evolution. Uh, this game is just as lazy as it is uncreative. Seriously, what the fu- Part 10, Luzamine. You're saying it wrong. It's- Lusamine. Not- Lusamine. God damn it, how do I pronounce her name again? Lilie. Luzamine. I'm gonna call her whatever I like. Lusa Minion of this game is a big criticism of USUM and it is even admitted by stands of this game too. In the original Sun and Moon, she was the best part of the story and the main antagonist. A MILF who went cuckoo for Coco Puss when her husband died, then fused with a fungus because Oromori's nationality makes him like tentacle porn I guess. She wasn't trying to take over the world or end the world like previous generation villains, but in this game, Luza Mina's Tiriff's personality, characteristics, and role in the story of the game was completely changed to the point of near character assassination. If USGM was a proper sequel, we could have given Luza Minesweeper a proper redemption arc, but this is just SM Dumber. Now instead of of being a complete villain, she's now a tragic heroic figure that just cares too much about Pokemon and Nalola. Boo hoo. Lady, you literally hired punk dogs to kidnap your estranged daughter, did questionable experience experiments in your underground James Bond villain lab, attempted to murder a legendary Pokemon that your daughter loved, disowned two of your children, and froze Pokemon in cubes against their will. You are a criminal. Stop right there, criminal scum! Oh, but the game's story insists she's a tragic, heroic figure that is protecting the world from Necrozma. Wait, what does even Necrozma do? They keep mentioning about how Necrozma is trying to steal the light or something. Is Necrozma the thing that Ron uses in Deathly Hallows? Anyway, she even literally says, I'm Luzamini 14. For fuck's sake, she isn't the Iron Man or the goddamn Batman. She's not a comic book superhero, but a leader of a science institution that researches Pokemon. What were they thinking? After the story ends, she just hangs around doing stuff not in jail. No atonement for what she has done, just hangs around. Now pay your fine, or it's off to jail. You know, making her into a heroic figure isn't actually a bad idea on paper, but that requires a lot of story changes. That requires effort, and simple things like changing the scenario so she isn't committing crimes or getting rid of the 3D models of frozen Pokemon in a room requires time and effort. We have to reuse most of the same cutscene from the last game because we're too lazy to create new cutscenes for this game that will make Luza Minute Maid look less evil. So shut up! Part 11 Ultra Rika Squad and Ultra Megalopolis and because Lusa Mein Kampf is no longer the villain, instead we got sort of villains called the Ultra Recon Squad. These guards are probably the worst villains in the entire series, and can they even call B villains? I don't get what these people's objectives were, and I think the only reason they existed is to make the story slightly different during the mid game. <laughs> Your costume is ridiculous. The places where they show up are the only story changes in the main campaign with their annoying music, so my eardrums get raped. <laughs> And these clowns hail from Ultra Megalopolis, probably the most laziest part of the entire game. If you watch the trailers for USUM, this was one of the main marketing points. You can now travel through the Ultra Wormhole to visit strange dimensions where darkness comes from and fight the evil Necrozma. Even the concept art and poster they showed off looked great. Looks sort of like Coruscant or Mushroom City from Mario Kart Double Dash at night. But in actuality, this place is just an empty hallway, no worse than the Vast Pony Canyon Trial or Smike Muff's Gym in Sword and Shield. Do you see why this game is worse than Sword and Shield? It has two hallway sections, which is more than one in Sword and Shield, so USGM is worse, objectively. 
Anyways, jokes aside, I'm now reminded by the distortion world in Pokemon Platinum, and that also makes me realize Necrozma ripped off Giratina as well, but whatever. Anyways, Ultra Megalopolis in Distortion World is in the end the same thing, an otherworldly dimension where the third legendary resides that is made for the third Pokemon game. The difference is, Distortion World is a moody and memorable place because of its camera physics and the crazy puzzles, and it's one of the most meaningful parts of the entire fourth generation of Pokemon. Ultra Megalopolis, on the other hand, is a fancy hallway that is empty and devoid of life, sort of like the creative mind of the head of Game Freak. Like I mentioned previously, Hammerlock Stadium in Galar and this place can be used to summarize up the current state of the Pokemon franchise. Might look fancy on the outside, but in actuality, rushed, lazy, and cut corners. Part 12, Team Rainbow Rocket and Giovanni. Look what you have made. Let's also talk about the main post-game content of the story, Episode RR. Some of you may find it surprising that I'm going to complain about this part of the game, because most of the fanbase seems to like this addition to the game. I disagree, and after playing it I can say, THIS GAME IS FUCKING HORRIBLE AND IT'S A SHITTY PART OF THE GAME! Okay, okay, over exaggeration, but I only see it as lazy nostalgia baiting and another case of wasted potential. So in the post-game of USUM, instead of the quest with Looker and Annabelle, we get this. Aether Paradise is taken over by Team Rainbow Rocket, a version of Team Rocket from a different dimension. They take over Lusa Minecraft's oldest Anarchy Server 2B2T's mansion, and you have to go battle some grunts and battle every single antagonist from the previous generations. Yes, you get to fight fan-favorite characters like Maxi, Cyrus, and Gestis, and all of them are equipped with legendary Pokémon. There's your mini Reshiram, everyone! On paper, it was a great idea. Getting all the villains back from the previous generations, it would be great fan service. Except the execution was horrible, and it was really bad kind of fan service that's just plain boring. I'll explain why this sucks. First, the whole episode RR feels lazy and is just boring. Basically, the whole episode is just one dungeon that you have to go through with six boss trainers, and that's it. You know, if you're gonna bring in characters that try to literally control gods, having them quarantined in a room feels like a letdown. Worst of all, the dungeon design is really boring. All the rooms and hallways look exactly the same, and all the puzzles are again, Canto Nostalgia. Remember the spinning tiles? Remember the warp zones? Remember red, blue, green, and yellow? SHUT UP! SHUT UP! SHUT UP! Also, only Team Rocket Grunts appear, one male and one female model. Your clones are very impressive, you must be very proud. No Team Plasma, Aqua, Galactic, or whatever Grunt. That must have been too much work modeling them all, right? Worst of all, all of the Rocket Grunts use one or two Pokemon each, and all of them are, you guessed it, Kanto Pokemon. Are you happy? Hey, yeah. And you walk up the same hallway to the same door to fight two Rocket Grunts, not double battles by the way, so you can progress to the same looking runes with the evil bosses. Look, even a knucklehead like me, who never programmed anything, can see they spammed Ctrl C and Ctrl V for these environments. Second, I think Giovanni leading this group of evil psychopaths is really wrong. I think it's almost character assassination to see this egocistical maniac serving under their most tame guy out of the bunch, especially Cyrus and Lissandre, who literally brainwashed people to get people to help him destroy the world. Do we have to sacrifice the character of these great villains just so we can see them again for nostalgia? The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be... unnatural. Sir, there's literally no build-up in the main game and explanation of these villains showing up. Somehow Palpatine returns. All of these evil gym leaders are from parallel Earths scattered by one man, Giovanni. Okay, Giovanni in the original games worked because he was a simple mafia boss in charge of a gang. The man is literally named as a stereotypical Italian mob boss. He wasn't a dimension-hopping cosmic being that could open wormholes between worlds. He wasn't the fucking anti-monitor from DC Comics, but that's just what he is in the game. There's literally no reason for Giovanni and Team Rocket to lead this group, other than He's from Kanto, the greatest reason so he can rule everything. OMG, he uses Mewtwo even though Giovanni didn't have anything to do with Mewtwo in the original game, that was just an anime thing. The Perilous Earth thing is just a lazy contrived way to get all these guys together in one building. What's also disappointing is that I think this could have been easily fixed by tweaking the story a tad bit. Maybe say Luza Minuteman or Faba was experimenting with Ultra Wormholes and they accidentally opened the doorway to evil dimensions that brought those evil team leaders to this dimension. 
But no, they appear out of thin air without explanation because fan service has to happen and we have to use something to bait the old players for our lazy game. Fourth, like everything else in the game, the missed potential. There are five evil teams and five fucking islands in Ilola if you count Egg the Paradise. How about you have Akala Island taken over by Team Plasma led by Gessis, Ulaola Island taken over by Team Flare led by Lissandre or something? Now that would be an awesome and epic post game to wrap up the entire 3DS games. Saving the region from an army of super villains, but no. Everything related with Gay Rocket literally takes place in the confined spaces of Lily's house. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. Come to think of it, Giovanni's forever enemy, Pokemon Trainer Red, is in Alola when this happens. But no, Red is stuck in the battle tree for fan service there. They don't ever meet each other, and it's another missed opportunity. I will give this though, I liked it when Chorus appeared to meet with Guesses, and it was a fun moment. But Guesses in this game is Guesses from Black and White 1, and Chorus is a character that first appeared in Black and White 2, and. Oh no, I've gone cross eyed. Part 13 The Ultra Wormholes and Legendaries. Let's talk about the other major post game content other than the Rainbow Rocket thing. Hey kids! Remember in the old games, we created events and dungeons for every legendary Pokemon with overworld sprites which made legendary Pokemon feel special and godly? And because of hardware limitation, we had to remix new songs of legendary Pokemon themes every time they appeared in a new generation, so they really did feel special. Now in Warras, we kinda got lazy and created the Pokemon Hoopa for an excuse to bring all legendary Pokemon into one game. We also reused the music from the old game, so be prepared to hear 8-bit music from your 3DS's speakers. But at least in that game, we put in effort to make some legendary Pokemon be at places that belong like Lugia and Seamawville. But in this game, we got lazier and decided it's too much work creating specific areas or spreading legendary Pokemon throughout the Alota region. So we decided that every Pokemon fan should be tortured by being forced to relieve the experience of playing Superman 64 with motion controls. And that's what we came up with and called it a day. Have fun, you fucking morons! What kind of game is this? Is this some sort of insanity test? Uh, what is there more to say about this mode? This mode sucks because it has nothing to do with Pokemon. Like Mantine Surfing, this minigame is too detached from the main Pokemon gameplay, and there is way too much RNG involved. And this is just a prime example of cutting corners. You know, since Ultra Wormholes are literally devices that allow you to travel between the Pokemon multiverse, I see another missed potential here. Imagine if you could use the Ultra Wormhole to travel to places from previous games, like going to Spear Pillar to catch Dialga, or going to Dragon Spiral Tower to catch Reshiram. But no, instead of doing proper fan service by recreating old famous areas in 3D for legendary Pokemon, let's have all them be in generic looking caves and forests. Also, when you battle them, you have to battle them in this weird generic green space. I just also want to say I don't like catching legendary Pokemon in this game because it feels like a chore. Going into a deep dark dungeon and finding a legendary Pokemon and catching it felt like an actual challenge in the old games. It felt rewarding. Now the legendaries don't feel special and feel derivative. Simply put, this mode is quantity over quality. Like the rest of this game, DISAPPOINTING! Part 14, Weird Little Minor Details Before I wrap up, I want to mention minor stuff that feels unfinished, or weird hiccups that prove Game Freak was rushing to get out this game in time. First, the Executor Island feels weird. It almost feels like they were planning to create a Mew Island trial here, because we have Mew animations of Alolan Executors standing around in the overworld. And it almost feels like a trial. My guess is this was going to be Ruki or someone else's trial, but they ran out of time or got lazy during development, so Executor Island feels like a missed opportunity. Second, I remember everyone begging Game Freak to put following Pokemon in the overworld, a feature forgotten since Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I also heard data miners found that all Pokemon in Gen 7 have walking animation in the game, so they're planning to implement it. And since it wasn't in Sun and Moon, they should have put it in this game. Problem is, they were rushing, so they didn't. Instead, for some reason, Hao seems to be the only person in the entire game that uses the following Pokemon feature. Like in battle, his starter doesn't come out of the ball. 
and its Pokemon follow him around in cutscenes. So they cut corners again by having the following Pokemon only happen to our rival, and we had to wait for LGP for that feature to fully become realized. Lastly, Zygar still got the short end of the stick in this game again. It shows up during the credits for some reason, and you can just catch it in a random cave in Alola post game. Okay, why is the legendary Pokemon from the Kalos region just hanging around in a random cave in Alola? Shouldn't Zygar be along with all of his pals and other legendaries in the Ultra Wormhole? Why does it get special treatment but a lazy treatment by having it camp in a dank cave? I guess this is what Game Freak says to this green Pokemon every day. Part 15, Mina's Trial. I want to wrap up this review with Miss Come Out With A Trial's Mew Trial because I think it can be used to summarize up what is wrong with this fucking game for people who still don't understand me. In the original Sun and Moon, very type Captain Mina's trial got obviously cut because they ran out of time for development. She just shows up and just hand use a Z crystal and you could almost faintly hear Masuda and Omori <laughs> laughing at you through the game somehow. Anyways, they sort of fixed it by giving her a proper trial. But what they did with Mina's trial is everything that is wrong with USUM and Game Freak these days. In their previous game, she mentioned how she wants to make a trial that involves painting. And based on her character design, it is clear her entire gimmick is that she likes to draw and she's an artist. Okay, common sense dictates that if you're gonna make a new trial for her in this game, since she's an artist, you make a trial with a mini game that involves drawing or coloring. Since the 3DS has a touchscreen and a stylus, a mini game that has you drawing a Pokemon or coloring in a Pokemon seems fun, right? Sort of like the weird spin off game in the 3DS. But no, because we live in a dark timeline where Game Freak doesn't think of common sense. Instead, we got a trial that probably took the most minimum effort to code. It's just a glorified fetch quest. Basically, she has you revisiting all the island captains before her to battle all of them. Oh, and because kids can get fucking lost traveling to areas that they've already been to, the game offers you to teleport you to places that have the island trial captain waiting. It's just mashing the A button at this point. Is this really the best trial they could come up with? Is this what the final island trial in the entire game deserves? Does this scream creativity or art? Ugh. The stupidity level of this trial is off the charts, and small little details like this that keeps piling up into a mountain of shit is the reason why I fucking hate these games. And people salute this game as the best modern Pokemon game? Are you fucking serious? Part 16. What was the point of these games? Pokemon Yellow version, Crystal, Emerald, Platinum, Black and White 2 all felt like passion projects. The reason why they were made felt like it was the developers wanting to take another shot at the game so they can perfect the games. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is anything but that. It's rushed, lazy, added pointless new features, baited to nostalgic fans with half-assed fan service, changed the story to wars, while sacrificing the potential of being a third game or a sequel to a decent game. And that's why Pokemon USUM are my least favorite Pokemon games. They just summarize the state of the Pokemon series these days. No passion, rushed, cutting corners, even the quote unquote objectively worst games in the franchise like X and Y and Sword and Shield still felt like they had passion in them. They actually committed to creating a new world, writing new characters, designing new Pokemon, the problem of those games was that they just cut a lot of corners to get there. This game is just cutting corners without anything original with zero effort. USUM is just Game Freak going, Lemao XD, we just need to milk the 3D's market before the system dies out, and that's literally it. And that is why in my heart, USUM is indeed the worst Pokemon game in the entire series, no matter what the other games seem like. USUM in the end is a disgusting fucking burger that made me lose an appetite while making this video. Sword and Shield may have been the catalyst of turning the Pokemon fanbase into angry people, but I think the starting point of that downward spiral was these atrocious games. Even up until Sun and Moon, though the games felt incomplete and some parts were felt misguided like the story, I felt like there was passion in it. They cared until this game. And they haven't been caring ever since. When Game Freak announced that they were not gonna make third versions anymore but make DLCs in Gen 8, I was originally very angry. But after playing this, if they're gonna make the third game just like this level of quality, this level of half assery, maybe they should just stick to DLCs. All I can say is, hopefully, Game Freak actually puts effort into the next entries after the backlash of Sword and Shield. And that is all. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. 
It was a real journey for me, going from ranting about the Pokemon franchise in a whole, to talking and reviewing my most disliked Pokemon games. For all the small number of fans that were there with me during the journey, I would like to thank all of you for helping me get there. Now I can finally put these goddamn Gen 7 games to rest, and that makes me feel relieved. I may put off Pokemon for a while, but this franchise will always do what it's good at, bringing me back. And it's inevitable by the end of this year anyways. Before I continue on, I want to do a brief tangent on a cutscene in the game that happens with Gestus in Team Rainbow Rocket episode. So when you defeat Gestus in battle in USUM, he says that he finds it unacceptable. Lily tells Gestus to fuck off, then the camera flips away? Lily goes, ah! Then Gestus is standing over Lily, and she tells the player to throw away the Pokeballs if she values Lily's life? What? Okay, first, what is he threatening to do? If he was holding a knife or a gun to Lily's head, it would make sense, but this is a game rated for E for everyone, right? Also, that would require coming off a gun or knife model and an animation of a character holding a weapon, which is work. Is he threatening to punch Lily to death or something? Second, I've kind of talked about this in the history of hyperspace video that no one watched, but there are things you shouldn't do in a story because rules are broken and cans of worms aren't opened. This moment is very similar to the hyperspace ramming scene in The Last Jedi. Why? Well, I thought it was kind of an unspoken rule in the Pokemon universe when you defeat an evil team leader in a Pokemon game, that evil person must give up all of his evil plans. This is similar to how there is an unspoken rule in the Star Wars universe that ships shouldn't try to collide with each other at hyperspace speeds, despite being able to collide with objects like stars and supernovas. Like, Giovanni loses to a kid, bam, he disbands Team Rocket. Cyrus loses to a kid, he just gets angry a lot. Guess this even in the OG Gen 5 games does the same thing too, he just pouts and is done. So why the fuck is he trying to cause physical harm to a person now? This is just lazy writing and completely breaks the rules of Pokemon because now you ask yourself, wait, why don't evil team leaders just shoot the main protagonist with a gun or something? It makes no sense! I firmly believe Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire could have been one of the best Pokemon games ever. And I bet real money that it'll be better than anything Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl will ever become. But there was a glaring problem. These games treated it as if Pokemon Emerald didn't exist. Features from Emerald was gone. Features such as... The Battle Frontier. Where is it? Where is it? Where the hell is it? Where the hell is it? Stay with Seven! Seven! Eight! Nine! Hello fellow Jerry Cans. In a few weeks, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl will be released for the Nintendo Switch. So to celebrate the occasion, I think it will be a very good idea to look back at Game Freak's most recent attempt to remake a Pokemon game that isn't the best generation region. And that is of course the Gen 6 Pokemon games. Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, released in 2014 for the 3DS. Except for the Let's Go games, the general consensus of these games is that they are the worst Pokemon remakes because of the missing features. However, even though I acknowledge these games have a lot of problems, I believe these games are underrated gems on the 3DS that deserves more credit, because these games got many things right that other remakes have not. And even Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl has already failed some of it, based on the trailers at least. So, let's take a look back at Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Kidum Red. Part 0 The last Pokemon game I was hyped for. 
Unlike my other reviews, before I start reviewing these games, I want to talk about my personal history with this game because I have a personal attachment to this game and the Hoenn region. Yes, unlike Unovaro Alola, your fellow Jerry Cam may or may not be biased towards Hoenn games. You see, the Game Boy Advance was the game console I had as a child growing up. So naturally, I own all 5 Gen 3 Pokemon games, and I played these games like a cult as a kid unlike other Pokemon games, which I have very little nostalgia for. I know the whole region like I know the back of my hand, so I can draw the map of the whole region on a blank piece of paper to just pure memory. This is my rendering of May, even though I can't draw anything other than stick figures. I still own the Prima guidebook for Pokemon Emerald, and the state of it can tell you how much I read this thing on the toilet during my childhood. I also had the poster with an epic drawing of Rayquaza, Groudon, and Kyogre that came with the guidebook plastered on my childhood bedroom wall that I have lost over the years, sadly. I still own Pokemon Coliseum and its Prima guidebook too. I'm basically a Gen 3-er, so when Game Freak announced in a crappy rush teaser video that they will remake the Hoenn games, my hype level went off the roof. These days, when I hear Game Freak is gonna attempt to do something, my first thought is concern. Or thinking, how are they gonna fuck it up this time? But back in 2014, think about it. Game Freak was a brilliant Chad god tier game developer that made excellent games 4 years in a row without a hiccup. And even though the previous installment XY wasn't very good, everyone didn't mind back then because the graphics were amazing. So based on Game Freak's track record at the time, everyone had every reason to be hyped for the game, since the last remake, Harkon and SoulSilver was excellent as well. The reason why I'm saying all of this is because Oras was the last Pokemon game I was hyped for. Because back then, it wasn't embarrassing to be a Pokemon stan, since the games were genuinely good. So I followed the release of Oras by watching all the trailers, watching all the interviews of Junichi Masuda, and this new tall guy called Shigeru Omori. Also, just before the release of the game, there was the Pokemon World Championship 2014, which by the way, is the last time I was interested into competitive Pokemon. In it, a legendary player named Sejun Park won the tournament with a Pachirisu on the team, not with some dumb OP Pokemon like Salamence or Tyranitar. Draco Meteor from Jody onto that Pachirisu. Uh, probably originally targeted for that guard jump, will connect, will deal some good damage, but we've already seen not enough. That Pachirisu is so bulky, if that Mo Rotom's Leaf Storm wasn't proof enough, it just tanked a Salamence Draco Meter, and no flinch! So Rock Slide does come out from Garchomp, that should be a double KO! No! 2 HP from Salamence, but fortunately, we'll have to see, it. will the Sand stick around? Yes, one more turn of Sand does pick up the KO. So, to celebrate this, it was decided that the developers of Game Freak will come to Seoul, capital of Korea, to congratulate him. They came to Seoul's Dongdaemun Design Plaza (DDP) to congratulate Sejin Park, hold a fan meeting, and advertise the upcoming Oras game with a press conference. Seoul is my hometown, and is still my current residence. And I was actually there in the audience as a fan. Yeah, so unlike 95% of Poketubers on this website, I actually met Junichi Masuda and Shigeru Omori in real life. These are my personal pictures I took with my shitty Android phone back then. Masuda and Omori also took pictures of us. Do you see a funny gas cam man in the audience somewhere? What's funny is that if I think Masuda and Omori did this kind of event in Korean times, they might get jeered off stage after all the shenanigans they pulled in recent years. But back then, we cried out towards them like they were gods. After all, the reason I went to the event was to meet my childhood idol, Junichi Masuda, who had a hand in creating my childhood's most memorable experiences. Oh, how I was innocent back then. Times changed, and I am a jaded, cynical 23-year-old making YouTube videos that explain how Pokemon sucks, and videos making fun of the man now. Oh, the irony. I thought we had the same goals. Things change. I changed. The game's over. Masuda. I quit. Anyways, Oras was the first and last Pokemon games I've ever pre-ordered, which we shouldn't do by the way, and it was also the only game I bought both versions. Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire was released on November 21st, 2014. My birthday is November 22nd by the way, so Pokemon Omega Ruby felt like Game Freak's personal 17th birthday present to me. 
Your fellow Jerry can ran happily to the store on his birthday to pick up the game. And this is the photo I took during that day because I was amazed that the game wished me a happy birthday the moment I stepped into Old Dale Town's Pokemon Center. So I got my Groudon and Kyogre figure, Groudon Thermos I still use to this day, and my body was ready to play Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. So what did I think of these games after playing it? After all that build up, you might think I hate these games, but I did love it in the end. It's the final Pokemon game I would call unironically excellent. But there were some serious problems with it of course, which left me sorely disappointed at that time, making Oras the final Pokemon game I was ever hyped for. But after all that's happened, the past seems to get brighter, and I now forgive some of its sins. Every day, the future looks a little bit darker. But the past, even the grimy parts of it, keep on getting brighter. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, and let's start from the ground up, starting with my favorite aspects of the remake. Part 1. Expanded Cutscenes and Characters If you ask me what was the favorite aspect about Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, I would answer, Adding so much characters to the game with the revamped characters and the added cutscenes. The story is exactly the same as the original games because it's a remake of a video game that had a really simple story, which is to get all 8 gym badges and stop evil team from awakening a lizard or a whale. So the improved and fixed moments is what matters. Now understandably, you may think I hate cutscenes in Pokemon games after my Ultra Feces and Ultra Urine review where I complained about the cutscenes, but that is not actually the case. The problem with the Gen 7 games was that there were too many fucking cutscenes that broke the pacing of the game and made the game a really fucking boring movie. This game, and the Gen 5 games frankly, have just enough cutscenes where you have enough freedom so you don't feel like you're walking through a movie when playing Oras. Huon is still not linear and there are many optional places to go, so you still feel like you're exploring the whole region when you play the game. And the time between cutscenes are long, so it doesn't feel like you're interrupted by one every 5 minutes. Cutscenes are good when done right, and can give meaning to scenes in the games. For example, I instantly knew that I was going to enjoy this game when I first started it, because I seriously think Oras has the best intro for any Pokemon game. I like how it starts with the original Game Boy Advance screen which was a nostalgia trip, but then the camera zooms out to show that it's actually the screen of the Pokenav. I always find it funny in previous games that devices like the Pokedex and the Pokenav always had the design of the console it was on, so actually seeing that the Pokenav had the design of the Game Boy Advance SP was a really nice touch. Then we get to see the truck from the intro of the movie actually fucking moving, finally, which was shocking after 10 years. Next, we see Pokemon hanging out in the forest, which is a lot better than the professor pulling out a Pokeball to show you what a Pokemon is. It goes along nicely with the theme of the Hoenn games, nature and coexistence. Anyways, the point is, the opening cutscene isn't too long and isn't a chore to get through, and it's done neatly and is memorable, so that's why it works. Adding cutscenes worked. I'll show how more cutscenes added more character to important NPCs like gym leaders. In the original games, the gym leaders were kind of boring because this was a pre-gen 5 Pokemon game, but it was understandable because it was 2D pixel art. So in this game, which was 3D, they added more character to gym leaders through little nice cutscenes or adding lore. For example, I like how Surfer Dude Brawly isn't just a generic guy wearing an orange shirt. He is an athletic guy that now lifts his weights bro, and his gym is an actual gym, an actual Surfer Dude. For Watson, I like how he actually made Marvel Sinti into a mall like he hinted in the original games. But if you've been to see Marvel and read all the lore and text regarding Marvel City, you know that he's a tyrannical businessman behind the scenes that mistreated his workers, such as making them overwork, not giving their wage on time, causing natural harms through pollution. In fact, see Marvel is a place where you can find a diary of a young boy whose father works for Watson, and he never shows up at home because of work, suffers from depression, and his wife is cheating on him by sleeping with another man? What the fuck? I also like how when you fight Flannery, even though the dialogue is the same as in the original games, yeah, imagine if they added a shit ton of dialogue to make it like USM and made it terrible, they added this little cutscene of her face going all crazy while she does her puny trainer fear me speech. <laughs> all the gym leaders got redesigns that make them all look hot, and the waifu baiting level of this game is off the charts. Imagine this game coming out in 2021 on the Switch with all the creepy fans on the internet. Imagine characters getting redesigns and aren't wearing the same fucking clothes in a fucking Pokemon remake, right? 
Probably my favorite cutscene of the game is when you defeat Norman. Again, the dialogue is the same as the original, but we get extra little details now of Norman closing his eyes and then smiling at the end. Cool little details that warms my little heart. I also like the added cutscene of Norman and Wally's father talking about their children when you defeat him. It expands Norman's role as your father in the story, and him being the franchise's still one and only father character makes him one of my favorite gym leaders of all time. This game is about family. It's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. Speaking of Wally's father, let's talk about the rivals. Part 2 Expanding the Rivals. Wally in the original games was kind of forgettable. He only shows up like twice in the game, so when you get to end of Victory Road, you're like, Who the fuck are you? And then remember it's that one kid from the beginning of the game. He didn't have his own theme like Brandon or May. Probably the only thing memorable about him was that he used the guard of oil. That's it. Now conversely in Oras, I like how in this game, they made him more memorable by giving him meaningful cutscenes when you meet him, so he feels more animated, pun intended. His new design works well as a both a shy, timid boy and a brave, handsome young man at the end. And when you battle him in Victory Road, it's one of the best rival fights in the entire series with the epic music and flower petals flying everywhere. This is how you do a remake and why I like Oras. You get a character that wasn't fully developed in the original games, give the character a new and refined design, and in the end, make him memorable by adding character with epic cutscenes and events. Will you fucking do that and not have everyone wear the same clothes for 15 years, Pokemon Rehash Diamond and Unnecessary Pearl? I also love Mei and Brandon in this game too. You know, out of all the Pokemon games that aren't Gen 5 or 7 where stories are the main focus, I do think Hoenn region had the best story and characters. It's like the only region to give you an actual father and mother, and it's also the only game to give you a romantic interest. Brandon x Mei is canon my friends! Some say the game forces you to ship so it's weak cringe shit, but I think slight romance tease is better than most other games where the rivals are either fucking annoying or just fucking terrible. You may call me a dumbass shipper, but I found the final cutscene in the adult episode where the main character takes Brandon or May out to a date to the space center pretty heartwarming, and a neat way to wrap up the game of the story. Also, in the original games, Brandon and May like disappeared from the game after Lily Cup City, you couldn't fight your rival with a fully evolved form starter, which was really fucking dumb. Even Pokemon Emerald didn't fix this, which was really perplexing. Thank god this game finally fixed it because Brandon or May shows up more in the story after Lily Cove, and you get to find a bonus fight with them after the end credits at Route 103, where you first battle them. They even use a mega evolved starter, which is a huge improvement from the original games. Oh, and speaking of end credits, this game also had the best end credits in the entire series. The game actually records which Pokemon you use during important battles, and you get to see them in the end credits. This is way better than the overrated Diamond and Pro ending with the stupid bicycle, or the lazy, rushed, half-assed, hard gold soul silver ripoff ending of USUM. Ah, uh, everything boils down to how USUM fucking sucks in the Jerry Kane world. Part 3 Magma and Aqua Double Pack this may be a personal opinion, but I think Pokemon splitting up into two versions of the same games is scumbag business practice. I really believe it's on the same level as loot boxes or microtransactions or fucking gotcha games. It's literally selling the same game twice but with minor differences, and it's highway robbery. Yeah, you'll need to buy one of them, but you need both versions to gotta catch them all. Maybe it was a nice marketing gimmick that worked in the 90s and early 2000s when everyone linked their Game Boys with link cables in the playground, but we're in the 2020s now. Everyone uses online. I can't believe there are people stupid enough to buy double packs, and that's where Game Freak can get extra dough. Remember when other franchises attempted this and failed miserably, or got harsh fan backlash? Pokemon can get away with anything. However, the only games I do think it's worth buying both are Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. The game story feels actually different enough, so I think it's actually worth playing both games. Maybe don't play back to back. But they're different enough, and the main difference between versions is of course the antagonist, Team Magma and Aqua. I love how they revamped both teams in this game, and they made them feel really different. Even though the story is the same, the two teams feel very different unlike the original games. Let's compare Arky and Maxi for example. In the original games, Maxi and Arky were basically the same person with just different designs. They talked the same, only difference was that one guy liked water and one guy liked land. They were really bland villains and their goals of trying to expand the sea or earth weren't even explained very well. Now in this game, Maxi is a mad scientist that is quite respectful to the player, and his defeat animation always gets a good laugh out of me. His calm and calculating demeanor makes him quite intimidating but likable at the same time. 
On the other hand, Arky is now Long John Silver with the accent, and a tan pirate that always calls the player Scamp. And he doesn't dress like a gay pirate anymore, and looks like an actual badass pirate captain. Their motivations got fixed too. Massey now properly explains that humanity needs more land, so we'll use Groudon to create more land for the advancement of humanity. Archie kind of rips off Team Plasma by having his motivation be expanding the ocean for Pokemon life, sort of like eco-terrorism. Their plans might still make no sense, but the game doesn't play it up seriously and it feels camp, which isn't a bad thing. Their unique and different personalities affect their respective team atmosphere too. I like how militaristic Team Magma is, and it's clever how their Team Magma salute can make up the letter M. Maxi feels like a scientist cult leader. His cold-hearted leadership actually makes him and Team Magma pretty intimidating. On the other hand, Team Afco feels like cool duck pirates, and Archie feels like a leader who's a bro to everyone, while being a charismatic leader at the same time. Both of their battle screens are epic too. When you battle Maxi for the final time, it feels like you're battling him in Dante's Inferno. And when you battle Archie, it looks like Percy Jackson and Aquaman went apeshit and created a whirlpool or something. They're also the only villains in the entire series that have redemption arcs, so they are unique. Being able to team up with Maxi in the post-game area was pretty epic. See, Game Freak? You don't have to rely on comically evil supervillains or horrible twist villains to make villains that are lovable and intimidating at the same time. On that note, let me go write my Maxi x Archie fanfiction. The admins are very memorable too. Especially Magma Admin Courtney and Aqua Admin Matt. As in, what do you call a guy with no arms and no legs laying on the front porch? Matt. In the original games, you wouldn't even remember admin names because they're so bland. But they made them so distinctive here. Courtney is basically now an anime yandere girl. She literally makes his hentai noises in the game and talks about analyzing the player. So how can a horny teen like me not like that in 2014? Aqua Admin Matt, on the other hand, may be the first officially gay character in Pokemon. I love the little details of Matt having gay fantasy porn videos about Archie in his room in the hideout. Matt, my bro, I think Archie prefers Maxi over you. I'm sorry, but you need to take the L. Anyways, for these reasons, Team Magma and Aqua in Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire are my favorite villain teams in the entire Pokemon series. Yup, base Jerry Ken does not go with normie picks like Team Magma or Team Rocket. Oh, and by the way, I personally like Team Magma better because of Maxi and Courtney, and I also agree with Team Magma's view that we need more land. After all, 70% of the Earth's surface is ocean, and us humans have been fighting wars over land since the dawn of time, so I think we could use more land. So I played Omega Ruby, and the footage used in this review is from Omega Ruby. Hashtag Team Magma best. Anyways, point is, they did such a great job at making Team Magma and Aqua different and likable, so Oras may be the only games worth buying two copies, and that's saying a lot. So, go buy the Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire double pack if you agree with me and pray to our Lord Omori that the game cartridge doesn't die or something. Oh, and if you're willing to buy double packs, did you know that me, Girm, is now a double pack too? I opened a new channel called Girm Blue that is for video essays about movies such as Star Wars or the MCU, so go check it out. The current red channel will be for gaming, like Pokemon. I followed the spirit of Kanto by splitting it to red and blue. Link is in the description below. Peace! Anyways, to wrap up my point, in this game, Archie starts to call you a scamp. He didn't call the player a scamp in the original games, so why is Gen 3 Archie calling the player a scamp in USUM localization team? This isn't the Archie from Oras! Could you even get that right, you fucking piece of shit game? Part 4 Kaiju Monsters Other than the characters, the only thing changed about the story in the main campaign is Groudon and Kyogre. What I always liked about the Generation 3 Legendaries was that they're just forces of nature, and the message of the game was that you shouldn't fuck with Mother Nature or else it'll bite you in the ass. What this game does well is that they did a really good job making Groudon and Kyogre feel like real monsters. Kaiju monsters, that is, which they are kinda based off of. When you enter the Cave of Origin, the fact that you have to put on a special suit makes it feel like you're actually going into the literal den of the beast, or HE double hockey sticks with magma if you're playing Omega Ruby and the radio stops working, and the bottom screen of the 3DS goes crazy. These are really effective ways to make the legendary Pokemon feel special and intimidating. And much more effective ways to show the power of legendaries other than Oh no, dark skies, large parasite floating in the sky, or It's a black dark dragon out of an alternate dimension that steals light or some BS. I also like the scene where you hop on the back of the legendaries. It was kinda cute and endearing to be honest. Like Groudon and Kyogre is offering to take you to their dens for an honorable legendary battle. Finally, a worthy opponent. 
The battle will be legendary. Groudon and Kyogre also receive new Uber forms called Primal Reversions. Which, to be honest, is just the same thing as Mega Evolution, but with a different name. But I really like Primal Groudon and Kyogre design, so I don't care. I just like the fact that they were creative, you know? And gave the legendaries new forms, so it's not just a one-to-one -one remake. Gosh, I wanted some new cool look for Dialga and Palkia on the box art of the remake. Part 5. Music. Let's stop talking about characters and talk about something else that I like from these games. I've never talked about the music of Pokemon games separately in my previous reviews because all Pokemon soundtracks are, you know, good. Judichi Masuda, Go Ichinose, and their team are indeed brilliant music geniuses. But as a Gen 3 year, I must highlight how much I love the soundtrack of these games. I'm sorry Gen 4 Sinnoh Lake theme stands, but Hoenn has the best soundtrack out of the entire series up to this point, and I think this game does the soundtrack justice. It's really impressive how they managed to convert the original, unique Game Boy Advance tracks into modern music. For this game, Game Freak decided to go for very orchestral music. It's kinda the first time the series attempted this, and did a good job with it considering it's their first. Yeah, I know Pokemon X and Y had modern music, but that game's soundtrack felt more like rock and techno music, not orchestral like this game. I've seen people not like this decision, but I believe if you're gonna remake classic soundtracks, orchestral music is the best way to go. Like all the town city root themes are so well made, and even though it's probably synth music and not live music, it feels grandeur like a real orchestra. Personal highlights for me are Verdant Turf Town with the piano. The surf theme, which is the best in the series by the way. To top left city. And Victory Road. For the battle themes, I love the Trader theme. The Gym Leader theme. And of course, the Elite Four theme, which may all be the best in the series, no pun intended. But it's not just orchestral music, the game incorporates modern synth sounds into the soundtrack very well, such as the rival battle theme that adds a funky, slapping beat to the song. My favorite remix might be Maxi and Archie's theme. Like when I heard that bass drop on my 3DS's tiny speakers, 17-year-old Guillermo's jaw dropped. Much better than the USUM remix. Part 6, The Dex Nav. Apart from the characters and the story, my favorite thing from this remake is surprisingly the bottom screen. There are actually many features to choose optionally from the bottom screen, and they all have nice UI. I won't talk about the features introduced in XY such as Pokemon Amy, cause again, save that for the XY review. However, I'll talk about the other major feature, and that is Dex Nav. Why do I like it so much? Well, I think Oras has my favorite catching mechanic for any Pokemon game. So I'll explain how it works. In the overworld, Pokemon will appear as rustling grass, which was a feature introduced in Gen 4. Then on the bottom screen, you can see what Pokemon it is, and sometimes the Pokemon will have special egg moves or hidden abilities, which might be enticing for those competitive stands. You have to walk slowly, sneak up on the Pokemon, or else run away. This means you have to gently push your analog stick towards it. Also, in the bottom screen, it shows which Pokemon live in the area, sort of like the habitat list from Black and White 2, which felt solely missing in X and Y. A Pokemon you have already caught will appear on the screen, and if you click on it, that Pokemon will appear on the overworld. So hilariously, you can now summon super rare Pokemon like Bagan or Skitty infinitely on the overworld if you've already caught it once. There are many reasons why I like the Death Snap so much. First, it's the first game in the series that introduced a real-time element into Pokemon gameplay, pretty naturally too I might add. Since you have to sneak upon it and use your controls, it's not just mindless walking left and right with the D-pad until you run into the right Pokemon, or run from it if it's not like the older games. Second, since you can see what Pokemon it is, there's less stupid RNG involved. You don't have to spend like 40 hours running around with the same spot looking for Chimecho while running away from Pokemon. Third, it makes completing the Pokedex fun, 
since there's less mindless RNG going into catching Pokemon. Even though I only have pictures left because I stupidly deleted my old save file, Pokemon Omega Ruby is still the one and only Pokemon game where I completed the original decks. I caught all hole in Pokemon. And with the help of online features like the GTS and the Pokemon transfer from Generation 5 Pokemon games, and because they were 2 day carries so it's really easy to breed Pokemon, I actually caught 587 Pokemon out of all 719 Pokemon in Generation 1 to 6. Yes, Pokemon Hater Girm was truly a Pokemon stand back then. Things change. I changed. Oh yeah, and speaking of the national decks. Part 7. More than original Pokemon. Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire ironically was the last Pokemon game to be quote unquote complete because it was the last Pokemon game to have a national dex. Even though in the Gen 7 games you can transfer Pokemon that aren't on the regional dex from previous generations, the national dex did not exist so there was no point of collecting. Then in Gen 8, you can't even transfer old Pokemon because they were too lazy or rushed or incompetent to transfer all the models from the 3DS to the Switch. Like seriously, what the fuck? Why am I reminded of the iPhone here? You know how Apple has been steadily taking away features on the iPhone with each installment to see what they could get away with? First they take away the headphone jack on the iPhone 7, then they take away the free lightning 3.5mm adapter included in the box with iPhone XS, then they take away the charger that comes in the box with the iPhone 12. Mark my words, we'll get an iPhone that has no physical buttons and port at all, when wireless charging technology becomes good. Is Game Freak copying the scumbag practice by seeing how lazy they can get by steadily taking out features and testing the customer's tolerance for BS with each new installment? From no Battle Frontier to no National Dex to no transferring. Jesus Christ. Um, where was I? Alright, the Pokedex and Noras. Did you know that Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is the only Pokemon remake that actually expands the original regional Dex by including every new evolution of original existing Pokemon from games that came after it? Not even Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and most likely Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl were able to accomplish this. You might be surprised with Heart Gold and Soul Silver, but in that game, they essentially thought like some Pokemon for evolving without trading to the Sinnoh games, and they don't even appear in the Johto Dex. These include Pokemon such as Magnezone, Mawile, and Gliscor. Anyways, what I'm saying is, the original Hoenn Index was 202, but in this game, it's 211. They added all new evolution forms of Gen 1 to 3 Pokemon introduced in Gen 4, such as Roserade, Gallade, Purple Pass, Frostless, and Chingling into the Hoenn Index. You can get all these Pokemon in the main campaign. Why am I so obsessed with this? Well, I believe one of the reasons you want to play an actual goddamn Pokemon remake is not just for better graphics or quality of life improvements implemented in later games. Well, the reasons we like Pokemon remakes is because we get new updates to original Pokemon creatures like new forms, such as new evolved forms, mega evolutions, and updated stats and abilities. I mean, why replay the same game again if the Pokemon are going to be the same? It's more content. That's why I was happy to catch even useless baby Pokemon added in like Badu. Also, it just isn't just you who use Mew Evolutions. The NPC is also in Mew Evolutions too. Wally is the biggest example because he's using a Mega Galite instead of Gardevoir because his sexual taste went from fanboy to just boy. Also, the Elite Four uses Mew Evolutions too. In the original games, Phoebe used two Bunnets and two Dusclops, proving how rare ghost types are, but in this game, she also uses a Dust Snore in the team. Galacia used two Glalies and three Walrein family, which was fucking dumb. So in this game, the Celios have been replaced by Gen 4 Pokemon Frostlass. Also, I mentioned this was the last Pokemon game to give us the National Dex, right? Well, in every game before this, the National Dex was acquired in the post-game, making it post-game content. But in this game, you get it after 8th Gym. Non-Hoenn Pokemon begin to sprout up all over the Hoenn region, giving you incentive to explore the region again. Also, the trainers in Victory Road, unlike the original game, use National Pokemon and many of them use tough biscuits like Rhyferior or Darmanitan, making it the most challenging part of the game. I love this version of Victory Road, and it's the only part of any official Pokemon game that felt like a Driano ROM hack or something, because there are so many plentiful Pokemon. I do wish these kind of sections were longer, but I was happy with what I got. Anyways, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl will apparently have only Generation 1-4, 493 Pokemon in the game. We won't get new Gen 8 evolutions like Mr. Rhyme or Obstagoon in the game, and we wouldn't be able to get post-Gen 4 Pokemon in the post-game. Oras might not be perfect, but it felt complete and refreshing compared to what we're about to get in BDSP. Part 8. Fly me to the moon. Let's get to another favorite feature of this game, and of course, it's the Eon Flute. Basically, after you defeat Crowdon or Kyogre, 
You can use the Eon Flute to summon Latios or Latias. You can ride on their back in real time and explore the skies of the Horn region. Man, this mode in the game might be simple, but it was a dream come true for me. Even though the map is not that big, I still love it, and I'll explain why. First, it actually has practical usages. In my USUM review, I complained about the Mantine surfing because it had nothing to do with the core mechanic of Pokemon games, it's a stupid minigame they put in at the last minute, and its only usage was to farm BP. Well, the flying in this game actually isn't useless eye candy, because the Eon Flute is the key item, so you can use it instead of HM Move Fly. It has the practical usage of being able to move across the map without the usage of an HM Slave. Second, they also have Mirage Islands that randomly spawn across the map, so there is some exploration to do. You can get non Hoenn Pokemon in these Mirage spots, so there is another practical usage to the Eon Flute. Third, just being able to see the actual Hoenn region from the sky rendered in full 3D is just awesome. I played The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword Remaster recently, and it has a similar sky flying gimmick with animals called Loftwings, but in that game, the land beneath is covered by clouds, so it made me feel like I was exploring an empty, dull void, not an epic open world Zelda game. It was the dumbest fucking thing ever, and made the Loftwing feel like a gimmick. Conversely, in this game, you can actually see where you're going on the ground, so it feels like free, unlimited exploration of the Horn region, and less like a gimmick. Wow, a Pokemon game actually beating something from a Zelda game. Would well, you look at that? Impossible. One of the main reasons I play Pokemon is for the adventure and the exploration, and finally seeing the region I played the hell out of as a child from the sky almost brought a tear to my heart. That image of the Hoenn region map I love to stare at in the Pokemon Emerald Prime my guidebook felt like it came to real life. Sipping from Mount Chimney to Sotopolis to Dufer Town. Ah. Uh, nowadays, Pokemon Sword and Shield got so fucking lazy, they couldn't even animate the cussing of you getting on a bird Pokemon when using Fly. Like seriously, what the fuck? Hopefully Legend Arceus captures the epic grandeur of feeling of exploring the sky, seeing it's going to be the first open world Pokemon game. Welp, I wrote that into the script too soon. Part 9, Map Design and Teleportation I think I've praised the game enough, so I want to briefly talk about things I have mixed feelings about, starting with the map design. I won't talk about the visual aesthetics of this game, because I want to save my thoughts on Generation 6 Pokemon graphics and Arsenal until I get to the review of Pokemon X and Y. Anyways, the Hoenn map. After playing the Gen 7 and 8 games, it felt refreshing playing a time where they actually still cared about creative map design. I actually had trouble getting through some of them, like some of the trick house puzzles, and the game doesn't treat you like a fucking toddler in some sections. I think this game really uses the camera well in some places, and the grid and chibi design helps to fill the uncanny valley. I think the graphics look fucking beautiful in some places of the map, especially Meteor Falls. There's actual attention to detail in the graphics, such as your reflection on the wax part of the floor at Norman Gym. The hallways between the rooms of the Elite Four really utilize the graphic effects very well. There's also really cute sections of the map like this TV studio in Marvel City. What is up, Jerry Kendler Nation? I'm your host, Space Gear Red. Let's get right into the muse! Anyways, point is, there is actual passion to the graphics and map design of this game. Like, can you name a single moment in Gen 7 or 8 Pokemon games where they're created with camera angles, or they utilize beautiful colors like this game? Instead, you got embarrassing moments in the games, such as lazy hallway island trials, or the lazy distortion world ripoff, or literally a city that's a fucking hallway. See why I'm saying the past looks beautiful now? Anyways, there was a nice quality of life improvement too. In the previous games, you could only fly to cities and towns you've already visited. In this game, you can fly to any city or town, plus route, dungeon, cave, and with the Eon Flute, makes it the Pokemon game that is the easiest to get around the map. I hope this feature is back in BDSP, cause some places in Sinnoh are a pain in the ass to backtrack. But there was a feature that I was think was intended by the developers as quality of life improvement, but fans see as hand-holding. You see, the game offers to teleport you to your next destination in some places. On one hand, I don't think it's a bad change because the game doesn't force you to teleport and they left it as an option. You can ignore your arrival if you want. However, 
the layout of the original home routes weren't designed with this kind of teleportation in mind. Like when you do the Meteor Falls quest, the game takes you back to Fallabur Town, then offers to teleport you to Mappa City. But the original game's intended for you to continue traveling through Meteor Falls, then to Northern Route 115, then to Rustbro, go through Rustdorf Tunnel, and break the rocks for the couple, then back to Malville. Like you will miss big parts of the game here if you teleport. But then again, in the original games, it was pretty cryptic where you're supposed to go next in many parts, so I had to rely on the Prima guidebook back then. Conclusion is, I mixed feelings about the teleportation thing. You be the judge if this was good or bad game design. Part 10. Too much water, 7.8 out of 10. I normally wouldn't talk about this, but it's such a famous meme regarding this game, so let's indulge for a bit. For those who lived under a very big white rock, I'll explain. When this game came out, IGN rated the game 7.8 out of 10, which was kind of low for a Pokemon game, especially compared to other games. I mean, these clowns gave Pokemon X and Y a 9 out of 10, Pokemon Sword and Shield a 9.3, and Pokemon Fucktard a 9. Seriously? Wata games literally rate games better than these people. Anyways, one of the main points they gave a 7.8 was too much water. People said this was a ridiculous way to review a game and that IGN was a secret subsidiary of Team Magma. But the thing is, I do think IGN had a point, and this game is indeed too damn wet. Especially if you played Pokemon Alpha Sapphire like the IGN reporter did. Like, half of the home region is water. One problem I have with the home region is that all the land routes are so colorful and diverse, and the other half of the region is just featureless blue ocean that all looks the same. It was like this in the original games, and it's like this in this game too. I honestly wouldn't have minded if they dried up some of the areas and built bridges in the remake in some of the ocean routes. 90% of the trainers on these water routes are swimmers who use the Waylord or Tentacle family, which makes it repetitive, and all the wild Pokemon that appear in the routes are the same everywhere. Like everything from Route 127 to 134 literally are the same thing. And this game's legendary is a water type Moby Dick, and the main antagonists are pirates that use water type Pokemon, and you are required to use three water type HM moves. Yeah, Oras does indeed have too much water. Good job pointing that out, IGN. I suggest you go play Omega Ruby if you want to be dry. Hashtag Team Magma Best. Oh, and speaking of rating games with numbers, I normally don't rate games and I have no intention of rating games at all. Because if I start rating games with numeral numbers, there will always be those assholes in the comments saying, How can you give something something a higher score than something something, you fucking entitled cretin? Developing a game isn't a fucking test. I don't want to be a scumbag profit company like College Board and Great Tests, so there will be no number rating for me. Of course, unless I change my mind in the future. So, I give Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire an 8 out of 14 chocolate chip scones. Part 11. Koopa Ring Legendaries One thing I didn't mention about the National Dex was that Game Freak made it so that if you've owned all 4 generation 6 Pokemon games, that being X, Y, Omega Ruby, and Alpha Sapphire, you can collect all 721 Generation 1 to 6 Pokemon, minus the event ones of course. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I applaud Game Freak for this choice because I believe it's the only generation where every Pokemon is collectible and self-contained in a single generation. Maybe it was their final gift to us National Dex fans before pegging us in the ass starting with the next generation. Anyways, then came the problem. What about the legendaries? Pokemon X and Y had only 7 legendary Pokemon, and these games need to cram in 31 other legendary Pokemon. I guess it would have been hard to write in lore, create dungeons, remix every individual theme for these 31 Pokemon, so Game Freak decided to cut corners with a Pokemon called Hoopa. Basically, every legendaries that weren't in the original games do appear, but they appear in these black holes that are spread across the map. Some Pokemon like Ho and Lugia appear in dungeons like Sea Marvel, Heatran appears in Scorched Slab. Some Pokemon, like the Lake Spirits, appear in Mirage spots that spawn in the world in certain time of the day. Some Pokemon, like Dialga or Palkia, appear in dark clouds in the sky. Yeah, so prepare to use the Eon Flute a lot. All the Legendary use the original battle themes without any remixes. The lore for this is that Hoopa is a Pokemon that can create wormholes through space-time to bring Legendary Pokemon from other worlds to Hoenn, so the soundtrack used our old music. When I first played this game in 2014, I was really angry about this feature. It felt like a lazy, contrived way to have all the legendaries in the game, and the fact that they used the older music stank of rushing, being lazy, and cutting corners. Which it is. 
but after all the Muir games, like the horrible, lazy Ultra Warp Ride in USUM and the legendary battles in the Sword and Shield, I changed my mind about it. At least this game didn't rely on horrible gimmicks like playing Superman 64 with mushroom controls, or online co-op Gigantamax battles. At least not all the legendary Pokemon are all acquired in the same way, and isn't stupid RNG, and they're spread out. You see, they did cut corners, but it felt like they did it out of a good cause, not to be lazy. They wanted to include every legendary Pokemon, so they picked quantity over quality. Of course, they could have spent extra time to create 30 plus dungeons and events to have every legendary feel special like Black and White 2. But I don't feel laziness, or maliciousness, or cynicism from the developers in this game, like we do currently with recent games. Part 12, Rapid Fire Round before I talk about the final two problems of this game in the post-game Delta episode, I'm gonna do a lightning's rapid-fire round of minor things in the game that's not significant enough to talk about longly. This video is already getting pretty drowned out as it is. Ready? The contest mode in this game is pretty bad and forgettable, but I never liked the contest mode in the original games too, or the Gen 4 games quite frankly, so... Do I look like I give a damn? At least they gave us a character associated with contest mode now, which is an improvement. The hidden bases mechanic in this game was excellent, you can create QR codes to post images online, making it easy to share. So it was the best online content on 3DS Pokemon in my opinion. Exchanging QR codes with friends was fun, and people unloaded EXP grind shops online, which was hilarious. Hopefully, the secret bases in BDSP are good like this too. HM moves suck. This game requires too many, but this was a problem with most Pokemon games before Generation 7, so I won't talk about it separately in this video. There weren't 5,000 Kanto references in this game unlike Pokemon X and Y or the Gen 7 games. And this may be the last time in the series where they did rely on fucking Gen 1 nostalgia. The main character has emotions! Brandon and May aren't emotionless, ruthless, fake T-800 exoskeletons in this game. Why did they fuck it up in the next installment? If you play as May, I like the little detail that makes her cute, like bending on her knees when talking to little kids. She also kneels down when talking to someone sitting down. Oh, don't kneel for the hiker. Oh my. One dumb thing about Pokemon X and Y was that gym leaders didn't get 3D models in battle, but instead used static images like every trainer in the game. Only the rivals and Team Flare got them for some reason. This game has the same problem too. All the gym leaders and Elite Fours use static images when you battle them. I don't mind random trainer NPCs having static images, but gym leaders though? They're important NPCs and I feel like I'm fighting a PNG image, not an actual character. Sorely disappointed with this small detail. Let's also talk about Mega Evolutions. This game introduced a lot of Mega Evolutions that weren't in X and Y. I like most of the designs, especially Slowbro, but I don't understand why non Hoenn Pokemon got them in a Hoenn game remake. Like Beedrill and Pidgeot didn't need Megas, he could have given it to poor Flygon. Does Game Freak just hate all ground dragon type Pokemon that aren't Garchomp? Another thing about Megas. In X and Y, only fucking 4 NPCs used Mega Evolutions in battle, which was a missed opportunity. Now in this game, more NPCs use in battle, such as the Elite 4 in their rematches. Still sad that gym leaders don't use it though. Well, that's it for the rapid fire round. Let's now talk about the first major problem of the game. Part 13, the easy difficulty. I will be brief with this because it's a simple topic but it's a serious problem with the game. Oras has two big problems and this is one of them. And that is of course, the game is way too fucking easy. I understand Pokemon X and Y being easy and Sword and Shield too, cause it's the first games on a console so you don't want to alienate casual gamers, and first games on the consoles always sell the most. But Oras isn't that. It was intended for nostalgic ridden lifeless Hoenn stands like me, who are likely hardcore fans. Why is this game so easy? This game has the same problem with Pokemon X and Y, and it's that the XP share is way too overpowered. Now, don't get me wrong, unlike other Pokemon fans, I love the Mew EXP share. Sharing all the EXP to all Pokemon instead of just one makes you grind less, and makes your team leveling up more balanced. The problem is that the level scaling of the game feels like they didn't design it with the EXP share in mind. Every gym leader are underleveled, so it's comical. Also, there are really baffling creative decisions that make the game easier than it really is. Like why are the Magma and Aqua admins all using one Pokemon each? That wasn't even a thing in the original games. I love me my Yandere sex android robot. Make her challenging for god's sake game freak. There's nothing much to say other than well, the game is too easy.
Personally, I think Pokemon Sun and Moon had the best difficulty in Pokemon because it's still a decently challenging game even when you have the EXP share on. So that's at least something Game Freak learned from this game, but then unlearned in Pokemon Sword and Shield. Part 14. The Lack of Emerald Content The other main problem of this game is obviously, ignoring Pokemon Emerald. If Pokemon Emerald didn't exist, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is a perfect remake that improved almost every aspect from the original Ruby and Sapphire games. But Pokemon Emerald exists. It can't unexist, but Game Freak chose to ignore it. Do they think we were dumb? Do they still think we're dumb by ignoring Platinum? Well, maybe we are dumb. Game Freak's effort of pretending as if Pokemon Emerald didn't exist in this game's main campaign is up to the level of comic absurdity. It's almost to the level of the Japanese government denying World War II war crimes or the Chinese government denying an incident at a square in 1989. They're really trying to erase history, but we Jerry Kent's never forgot. For example, the gym leader teams. Every gym leader in Oras is based off their incarnation from Ruby and Sapphire, not Emerald. Tate and Lisa only use Linotone and Solrock, just like Ruby and Sapphire, and don't use extra Pokemon, making their fight anticlimactic and easy. Pokemon Emerald was also the first game in the series to introduce Gym League rematches, but that's a feature not here too, which is surprising because even the previous bare bone game X and Y had Gym Leader rematches. So except for Wallace in the Delta episode, you only get to fight Gym Leaders once. So due to that, Tate and Lisa feels like PNG images that send out Solrock and Lunatone that can be beaten in 30 seconds with a Surf attack. Minor dungeons added in Emerald are gone too. Remember Mirod's Tower at the Desert Route? Well, that's gone, so the fossils are just lying around the desert for anyone to pick up, apparently. This is such a small minor dungeon. Was it so hard to design it in 3D? In the original Ruby and Sapphire, Team Aqua and Magma acted exactly the same with minor differences, so there were some unintentional comedy moments. Like, why was Team Magma's base in the sea? Pokemon Emerald fixed it by having Team Aqua's base be next to Lily Cove and create a new hideout for Team Magma under Mount Chimney. It makes sense for an organization that literally called themselves Magma to have their base be under a fucking volcano, right? Well, this game went back to the original games, and brilliant scientist Maxi is a moron by building a base on ocean rocks. Also, Groudon hiding out in a cave under the ocean in Pokemon Ruby was dumb as hell too. In Pokemon Emerald, they fixed it by moving Groudon to under Mount Chimney. Again, the game copies Pokemon Ruby, but now this time, poor ground-type Groudon has to rise out of the ocean and walk on the sea to get to Sutopolis. Bias towards Alpha Sapphire, aren't we? Why are we still here? Just to suffer. And of course, we have the final missing part of Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. The thing that made everyone get angry, and the thing that made me lose some confidence in the franchise. And of course, that is the Battle Frontier. Where is it? Where the hell is it? Where the hell is it? The lack of the Battle Frontier has been a running joke on my channel for over a year now, so let's finally talk about it in detail. It's really a shame the Battle Frontier is not in the game, because the ingredients for it are in there in the game. I'm saying this because there are these gimmick battles that felt like they could have been used for a battle frontier, but they didn't. I counted three in the game. First, in Marvel City, there's an NPC that challenges you to inverse battles. Inverse battles is a neat and fun idea which I'm surprised was dropped after Generation 6. Basically, tight advantages are reversed, and attacks that are not effective will be super effective, and attacks that aren't super effective will not be effective. It's a super cool mode where you need to think outside of the box. Second, again in Mava City, there is a food court minigame. Basically, you place an order and you have to wait at a table. Trainers fight you consecutively, and you have to make sure to end the battle in the exact number of turns as the game tells you to do so, such as 5 turns. It's a nice minigame that requires you to do precise timings. Third, Pokemon X and Y introduced Horde Battles, where you fight 5 wild Pokemon at once. This game introduces a trainer version of that, where you fight 5 trainers at once. Problem is, it only happens twice in the game. Couldn't they utilize this feature more? And they dropped horror encounters after Gen 6. Anyways, if they took these three battle ideas and created three facilities, plus the traditional renting facility battle factory, and the vanilla battle tower, boom. That's five facilities right there. A perfect battle frontier. I don't think designing a battle frontier is hard. Only if they took like two months more time of development to design new characters and model the facilities. Ugh. But no. Instead, we got the Battle House, a straight-up copy of the one from Pokemon X and Y. I think they literally pressed copy-paste on it and changed nothing except the battle music because some of the trainers that appear in it are NPCs that only appear in Kalos. Like, what the fuck? 
And as the cherry on top of this shit Sunday, they rub salt in their wound by teasing there will be a battle frontier. There are NPCs around the battle house talking about how they're building a battle frontier. And to top it all off, a model of the battle frontier is displayed and saying construction has started. They even remixed the frontier brain music for the forgettable battle chatelins just to add more tease to our musical ears and cocks. Let's briefly stop and just think about this for a moment because this could only mean three things. Think of it logically, there are only three possibilities of the explanations. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. 1. Game Freak was originally planning on making the Battle Frontier a DLC for the game, but something came up and they decided not to. 2. The people at Game Freak are sadistic sociopaths who find pleasure in teasing their fans and rubbing it in our faces knowing we want a Battle Frontier, but not giving it to us. Or 3. The people at Game Freak thought we wouldn't care if the Battle Frontier was gone, and all the references to it were nice easter egg fan service. Well, I hope it's the first explanation, because option 2 implies we are masochists, and option 3 means they're tone deaf as fuck. But I think option 3 is probably the most likely explanation, considering their complete obliviousness in recent years. How poetic. Anyways... Instead of giving us emerald content, they decided to give us something else, and that is of course the Delta episode. Let's finally talk about that. Part 15 the Delta episode and Shigeru Omori. I feel like Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire was a turning point for the Pokemon franchise. This game was directed by Shigeru Omori in his first debut as Pokemon director. It wasn't directed by Junichi Masuda, but that wasn't a surprise because he only directed first dual games like Ruby and Sapphire, or Black and White, or X and Y. Watch my Cannes Festival Reject short film if you want to see the full history of that. Link is in the description below. Anyways, Shigeru Mori directing this game wasn't strange. What was strange is what came after. Shigeru Mori would go on and direct Pokemon Sun and Moon, then Sword and Shield, which are the next two first duo games. It felt like Mr. Masuda was handing over the reign of the franchise to Mr. Omori, and this game was the beta test. And looking back now, this game feels like the preview of what's to come, and I could feel that mostly from the Delta episode. What I'm saying is, the Delta episode feels like a beta test for Pokemon Sun and Moon. So what is the Delta episode? It's the main post-game content of the game. So after the main campaign, you go on a 2 hour story mission, where you assist a character named Xenia. Apparently a meteor is falling from the sky and going to destroy the world, and you must awaken Rayquaza to stop it. How is it a beta test for Sun and Moon? Well, we both have story-focused storylines where the main character takes a back seat, and instead a cute pandering anime girl becomes the main character who has family issues. We both have too many boring cutscenes with too much text, and we both have a story about some MacGuffin about legendary Pokemon. Difference is, Delta episode is only like 2 hours long, but Sun and Moon is the whole entire game. I think this kind of storytelling method is a staple to Shigeru Omori's style as director, because every game he touches turns into a linear cutscene nightmare Pokemon game. Hence why I am pointing out this transfer of power in the Pokemon development team with the game. So basically, Delta episode is Omori using the post-game content as a test subject to try this kind of style, then fully developing it in the next installment. Am I saying Shigeru Omori ruined the Pokemon franchise like how Elon Musk ruined humanity? Possibly. Now I'll talk about things that didn't work with the Delta episode. First of all, I really do not like Xenia for many reasons. She's a character that doesn't work for me. First, she's an entitled self-righteous know-it-all and she keeps treating people like idiots. She's an asshole to everyone, especially to Steven. Look, I'm not a Steven stan, but I don't want to see someone calling the champion who was the final boss an idiot. You stupid. Second, her dialogue is just endless exposition dump to exposition dump to exposition dump. It's just poorly written. Third, she has the same problem with Lilia in the sense that she takes the role of the main character while you, the main character, takes a backseat as the cameraman. You become the side character, and what should be the side character becomes the main focus of the story. Fourth, she appears out of nowhere. I think they should have given her a bigger role in the main campaign like a team admin or something, but in the game, she only shows up like twice for like 2 seconds each. There is no build up to her or the Delta episode. The Delta episode is also the time where the Pokemon franchise introduced multiple parallel Earth theory to the Pokemon lore. Basically, one of the scientists' plan is to create a wormhole to send the meteor into a different dimension, but Xenia stops them because it'll send to the Ruby and Sapphire world of Hoenn. I like that they call the wormhole Link Cable, like the thing that connects literal Pokemon cartridges or worlds together. But this opened a can of worms with the parallel Earths thing, and Game Freak got carried away with the concept in the next generation. 
and finally jumped the shark in the brainless rainbow rocket episode in USUM. I swear to god BDSB or Legends RC does not mention this again, because I'm getting sick and tired of the Pokemon multiverse. Hello, Lucas. And finally, the main problem to Delta episode is that it's so fucking boring! You don't visit any new areas except until the end, and it's just constant backtracking to places like Granite Cave, or the Team Hideout, or Meteor Falls. They literally force you to revisit Moss Deep City three times, and one time is just for Steven to tell you something. Could you do this over the phone, mate? But, despite all the BS I hate from the Delta episode, I don't care about it. I still do like the Delta episode. Do you know why? It's the same for reason. It's because... You go to outer space, baby! Like, who the hell would not go through five spontaneous orgasms when you ride on Rayquaza's back and fly out to outer space? That fucking awesome moment where Rayqua crashes into the meteor, and then the triangle pops out, and does the movement of the puzzle you find on Birth Island, and holy fucking shit, it's fucking Deoxys, the most badass looking event legendary Pokemon that ever existed. Then you throw out Rayquaza against Deoxys, and you're literally fighting a Pokemon in outer space, motherfucker! You forget all that boring bullshit you just went through the last two hours, and that just looks like a build up to something fucking awesome looking back. Pokemon finally did it! We finally went to space just like James Bond, Jason Voorhees, and Mario! Ironic that a Pokemon game named after Celestials could've even pulled this off properly and made it stupid! Ahem, <clears throat> point is, Delta Episode has a lot of problems, but it gets good the moment you reach Sky Pillar because truly awesome things happen on it. Who cares about shitty characters or crappy stories when you get awesome music and you go out into space to find an alien being? See, Mr. Romori? You can shove shitty stories with lazy cussings up our ass as long as you have something awesome at the end of it as a payoff. I really do hope Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl at least gives Yurtina and the Distortion World the Delta episode treatment. But knowing Junichi Matsuda these days, Yurtina will be sitting on his ass in a cave waiting to be caught, surrounded by Zubats. No Distortion World, cause that's too much work. Uh. Conclusion If I had to summarize Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire with one movie line, it would be this. We were on the verge of greatness, we were this close. I really do think Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is an excellent remake. It added so much character to the classic region of Hoenn and its lore. The game looks beautiful, the game actually felt complete and is the best game to play for Pokedex completing enthusiasts, tried to make it fresh with new features such as the Eon Flute and Delta episode, and is overall a solid remake. It didn't have embarrassing moments like hallway sections, or cringe graphics and animations like we do with current games. It also wasn't a quote unquote faithful one to one remake of scaling HD port, and that actually cared for once. Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire may be the most frustrating games in the series because despite its accomplishments, there are two major problems. If this game wasn't so easy, and they didn't act as if Pokemon Emerald didn't exist in the main campaign, it really could have been one of the best Pokemon games up there with games like Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, or Pokemon Black and White 2. If they just playtested it a bit more, and had 2 more months of development time, maybe they could have perfected it. It's a shame they didn't, because overall, like the previous game Pokemon X and Y, the entire Generation 6 Pokemon feels like a missed opportunity, because the potential was there. But after 7 years, gosh it's been that long since the game came out, I'm getting old. I would say the game has aged well. Even though the next game, Pokemon Sun and Moon, wasn't terrible, I would say Oras was the final time the Pokemon series felt like a classic Pokemon game. Oh yeah, the all-time high point of the franchise was obviously Black and White 2, but this felt like the last time Game Freak was actually passionate with the games. It was the last time the game actually felt fucking complete. The next remake we're getting is a 1-1 to -one remake without any of the freshness or risks Pokemon Omega Ruby and Anapha Sapphire took. We won't get new forms for Pokemon, new Mega Evolutions, or character redesigns of all Sinnoh characters in Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. So yes, the whole remix may be disappointing in some aspects, but I'll still call it a well-made game. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is still worth trying out if you've played the original Pokemon Emerald. Unlike Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, which I still see no incentive to buy when Pokemon Platinum exists. So come join me on Twitch, I'm currently streaming Pokemon Platinum time to time, so I can make a video about it next. Link is in the description below. Anyways, since the game introduced the Pokemon Multiverse, maybe in a parallel universe, there exists a Pokemon Delta Emerald version, where all the improvements made in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire and the content from Pokemon Emerald exist in one ultimate tone game. But we don't live on that earth, and one can only dream about it. So get to work, 3DS hackers and modders!
Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? He does exactly what I do, but better. Seven, we'll grab that, all right? No, 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 no! Wait, 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 wait! Hey! Wait, 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 wait! That is one big pile of shit. You think you know bad, huh? You're a fucking choir boy compared to me! A choir boy! Okay. You French pig! Oh, I'm so happy to be here today. Yes. Evelyn. You crying? I see my life. If there is no you, it was beautiful. So, Pokemon X and Y for the 3DS. It was the first Pokemon game on the 3DS and it opened the 3D era of Pokemon. Is it a great game? Not really, but I don't think it's worthless. Many cite Pokemon X and Y as the start of the downfall of Pokemon. However, some cite it as an underrated gem that gets overlooked. Therefore, as it's time for the release of the new Pokemon games Scarlet and Violet, I think it's too time that we look back at these games that started the 3D era and see which opinion is right. I want to cut through the hype and judge these games fairly. This is a straight up review of Pokemon X and Y released in 2013 on the Nintendo 3DS. Part 1. Reputations, Incomplete, Parallels, and Reasoning Unlike my other reviews where I usually talk about the positives of a game first and go on to negatives, for this video, I will address the negative aspects of X and Y first. Why? Well, Generation 6 has a bad reputation among fans. I think X and Y is neglected and forgotten by most of the fandom. Hell, I think even the anime is more popular than the games. Like Google Pokemon XY, you'll get more results about the anime than the actual games. The biggest problem with this game in my opinion is unlike bad modern Pokemon games, it's not that there is bad stuff in it or there were some really dumb or baffling creative decisions, but that the game feels not done. Sort of like a hamburger that was cooked by an excellent chef, but the electricity suddenly went out in the kitchen halfway through cooking and you have to eat the patty raw. This game needed at least half a year more of development. Still though, all Pokemon games, even the worst ones, had potential to be excellent, but X and Y is the most tragic to me. Kalos has so much potential, but so much of it was squandered. Actually, X and Y are very similar games to Diamond and Pearl. Both are first dual games on a console, both ushered in a new age of graphics over Pokemon, Diamond and Pearl introducing half 3D, and X and Y introducing full 3D. But the perils don't end there. Both feature very similar lame villains, both feature champions that are very bad and don't do anything except look cool. 
and most of all, both feel like incomplete games and more like graphical beta tests. Difference is, Diamond and Pearl got Pokemon Platinum, a game that fixed almost all issues of the OG-based games. A truly wonderful game that basically saved Sinnoh and the franchise, which I've detailed wonderfully in a video in the past. Ha, shameless plug. That I'll see it completely ignored a decade and a half later. What's the difference between you and me? I'm not wearing hockey pants. X and Y clearly was setting up for a Pokemon Z. Kalos needed a third game, or a DLC, or sequel, or something that finished the region. An ultimate Kalos game. But we never got a Pokemon Z. Isn't it just a shame Kalos is the only region in the franchise that got visited once? Every other generation have been expanded upon either through third versions, sequels, remakes, ultra shitty cash grabs, and DLCs. Poor Kalos. Still, while you might expect me to call Pokemon Company greedy or Game Freak lazy, rushed and cutting corners for releasing an incomplete game, to play Devil's Advocate? I kinda understand what situation they're in though. You see, the Nintendo 3DS was revealed in 2010 and released in 2011. When Black and White 2 came out, Nintendo's newest handheld console was already a year old, and two years old by 2013. Pokemon has always been the franchise that carried Nintendo's handheld console sales, so Pokemon desperately needed a new game in 2013. Like, imagine if they actually skipped 2013 and released this game in 2014. Fans would have been rioted and asking for a new Pokemon game on the new handheld system. Nintendo would have been unhappy their new system is not getting a major release from a major franchise. 3DS sales might have not actually gone up and stayed bad like at its launch and became a failure of a system like the Wii U. Point is, Pokemon and the world needed X and Y in 2013 and there was no room for delay. However, while we can be sympathetic to the situation the developers were in, it doesn't change the fact that this game is incomplete and we're here to judge the game on its own. So, what parts of the game is unfinished? Part 2. Incomplete Let's get the obvious one out of the way. Some areas in the map just feel incomplete. Biggest example is of course the Kalos Power Plant. The Power Plant is a dungeon under the area known as Route 13. This place has many doors that should lead down to a Power Plant. You expect this to be like a World Island situation where it's a dungeon with multiple entrances that lead to different places, right? But in truth, only one of these doors actually leads somewhere. The rest are decorations. They were obviously planning a much bigger dungeon for this part of the game, but scaled it down. As a result, Kalos Power Plant is kinda tiny, and probably the biggest moment in the game that stinks incomplete. The second biggest sign is of course the in-battle trainer models. So in this game, random generic trainers in the field have chibi models in the overworld, but when you battle them, this 2D image appears. Look, I don't mind random NPCs not having 3D models in battle, and most of the illustrations are really well drawn. However, they gave important trainers in the story like the rivals slash friends, or the Pokemon professor, or main antagonist Lissandre, 3D models and animations, and all of them are animated pretty well. I like that important characters get special treatment, sort of like how in the Generation 4 games, only important NPCs got animated sprites. But they had to ruin it by not giving gym leaders animated character models. May I ask fucking why? Except for the rival, professor, antagonist, and champion, aren't gym leaders like the most fundamental important characters in any Pokemon game? Hell, they even made a gacha game that is mostly consisted of gym leaders. They're that much of a foundation of the franchise. But since the gym leaders are just images, I feel like I'm not fighting a gym leader but fighting a PNG image you find on Bulbapedia. It's just a shame. Couldn't they just make 8 more gym leader models and 4 more LE4 models? Probably the most offensive is that the champion Diantha ended up just getting an image too. Why? Why the hell is the fucking final boss of the game not a 3D model? What's more perplexing is that for some reason, every Team Flare member has 3D models. Not just the leader, but admins, but the grunts too? Like why the hell does a random flare grunt get one and gym leaders don't? What's worse is that unlike traditional teams where there's a leader, admin, and grunt, team flare is diverse as hell. There is leader Red Cyrus, then there are these bland admins with names that even a die-hard Pokemon fan won't be able to remember with a gun to their head. There's the Chorus and Tierno's love child, there are just separate, regular, generic male and female admins with no names for some reason, which other teams in the series don't have. And finally, there are the generic grunts, male and female. What were they thinking? Why have so many flare grunts? Why have more admins than usual when they're all bland? 
why animate them instead of the more important NPCs? I feel like when they were developing this game, they first started making the models for Team Flair, then they realized it's already two days before release, so they just released the game in its unfinished state. Pack it all up, pack it all up, only the gingers get 3D models. Another big sign of incomplete is the fact that there are no post-game areas. Even the previous first generation games like Diamond and Pearl and Black and White had areas to explore after beating the champion. Diamond and Pearl having the battle zone and Black and White having Eastern Unova. But in this game, after beating the game, you ride on a bullet train and get to explore one city. That's it! I feel like they were planning to make more routes for Kalos, especially in the southern part because Kalos is actually not France, but just northern France. But again, ran out of time. Part 3, The Characters The story and characters of this game feel incomplete too. I'm just gonna say flat out, I think X and Y have the worst story in the entire franchise tied with Diamond and Pearl. First of all, let's talk about the awful supporting cast in this game, starting with the rivals. This game has four freaking rivals, the most out of the entire series. Oh, I'm sorry, they're called friends, not rivals. Stop being such a pussy! Junichi Masuda, director of the game, stated in interviews that he wanted this game to feel like an adventure through a region with a group of friends unlike other games in the series. Traveling around the region as a group of best friends sound like a good fun idea on paper, but it's a really bad idea for Pokemon actually. Firstly, this is not traditional JRPG where human characters form up a party so you can travel around with them. In Pokemon, the creatures form the party, not the humans. Meaning you can't control 5 characters at once. In Pokemon, more rivals just mean more force script encounters and battles. Because of that, the game doesn't have time to flesh out these guys and make them interesting. It feels like there is too much for the runtime. Like your other sex rival, Callum or Serena. Their character is, uh, they're jealous of you, kind of. I really think they should have done a Brandon and May romance thing if they're gonna do this. They don't have an arc, they're just a straight line, I mean bland. Then there's Trevor. Run, you little bastard! His character is, he's a short nerd and he likes taking photos. That's it! Maybe if they made him the NPC in charge of a photography minigame or side quest involving pictures, he would have been more memorable, but nope, he's just a short kid. The worst is Tierno. His whole character is, he's a fat guy and he likes to dance. Could they get him more interesting stuff like his parents being assholes who don't like music or something like Bianca? A footloose situation. No, he's just a guy who likes to dance. And they could even animate a scene of him dancing with a Pokemon out of a Pokeball. Give this guy a looted color or something for god's sake. The only rival I liked is Shauna, cause it gave us a pretty nice cutscene with her at not Palace of Versailles with fireworks, that's memorable. And she actually has some depth, like being bubbly all the time, but being super serious in serious moments. But even she's way too pandering sometimes with lowly bait and creeps me out. Ugh. There are also other characters that don't go anywhere and feel like they were meant to be in charge of some mute cunt that got cut. For example, do you remember Dexio and Cena? They're Professor Sycamore's assistants, but they dress up like superheroes and show up sometimes. Well, what, is, what is up with that? You don't get to battle them, so they're walking text box generators like Lilia. These guys don't even get official artworks, by the way. When these two showed up in Sun and Moon later, I genuinely didn't remember who they were, and I was like, Who the fuck are you? The gym leaders and Lee Forwards are so bland, too. They just stay in their gyms and league all the time, and don't participate in the story at all except for Karina. We're back to gen 1 or 2 level of basic characters. It's just made worse from the early thing about them just being images, so they really feel like pictures, not actual characters. Remember in the previous generation, the gym leaders had larger roles in the story and were super memorable? That's gone here, I guess. Thank god this was fixed in Oras because the home gym leaders are so much better. I think the game had more plans, but they scrapped it midway. Like, one of the Elite Four mansions, she was actually part of Team Flare in the post-game out of the blue. But, she didn't appear as a Team Flare member in the main campaign, so it has nothing to do with anything at all. Why even mention that if it has no impact in the story? God, this feels like the Rise of Skywalker of Pokemon games. Ray, 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 I never told you Ray. Part 4, The Story Let's talk about the story too, cause it's a mess. After Black and White's okay attempt at an actual story, I actually thought Pokemon could write a compelling plot again. Boy, I was wrong. Again, it feels like another Diamond and Pro situation, where the story feels half-baked and rushed out with lingering plot threads. First of all, just like Diamond and Pro Cyrus, 
We get Lysandre, Lysander, Lysandre, oh fuck who cares, an evil team villain who wants to remake the world in their own image. Only difference is Cyrus thinks the world is incomplete, and Lysandre thinks the world is not beautiful. That's it. Worse, Unlike Cyrus, who got much more deep character development in Platinum through the Distortion World thing, he got like nothing to explain why Lysandre thinks the world is not beautiful and he has to go all super villain. He's just a pretentious douchebag that no one can relate to. Even worse, they tried to do the whole twist villain thing, even though his design screams Team Flair. Someone drove a hot dog shaped car through the window! Well, close our eyes, just take your car and get out of here! Sir. That's clearly your car. Wrong! There's a reason why Pro ZD's character for stereotypical twist villains is named Lysanderov. Why not make him wear clothes that hide his reddish mane hair or some shit? And I guess they did that right with Legends Arceus. Kudos there. Lysander is probably the worst Pokemon villain in history, other than Rose maybe and DP version of Cyrus. Finally, the whole main plot other than beating the champion thing, the plot with Team Flare and AZ and the legendaries, I want to ask Masuda, or whoever wrote the script of this game, what were you guys smoking when you came up with that? Like seriously, the lore and plot of Kalos kind of went off the rails and is batshit insane. So get this, you know the game has a very bright atmosphere and it's about a fun journey with friends, right? But the main baddie's plan is waking up a legendary Pokemon so that with said legendary Pokemon he can use an ultimate weapon that can apparently destroy everything somehow. Said ultimate weapon was built by an ancient king 3000 years ago, and apparently Mega Evolution channels the same energy. Said king built the machine because he wanted to bring back a dead Fluete, but the Fluete was sad because the king b killed a bunch of Pokemon with the weapon and leaves him. Said Fluete died apparently because there was a fucking war 3000 years ago for some reason. Uh, apparently the weapon made the king immortal, so he goes around dressed like a homeless guy and taller than Shane Madei. Look, I don't mind overcomplicated, fucked up lore in my children games. Actually, I love these kind of stuff in kitty stuff because it's kind of awesome to traumatize children. But, all of this dark, twisted lore doesn't have any bearing in the story. This cinematic that explains the backstory comes out of nowhere. The only relevance is that it explains what the weapon the emo baddie is trying to use is. It's just some pretentious exposition. What they really should have done is A. Flesh out Lissandre and Team Flayer more, and B. Flash out AZ and his backstory more, not with some stupid exposition dump cutscene. Again, it feels like they had more plans for AZ and Lissandre and Legendaries and Zygarde, but they stopped writing after just writing half of the script. But you might ask, will Game Freak build up on this Kalos lore that is interesting but never utilized well in a remake or something? Probably not because the developers seem to have forgot what the fuck was going on in X and Y. In Pokemon X and Y, the giant immortal guy as what was his deal? <laughs> Still, there are some story moments I like. I like the part where all of your friends gather for the final time at this bridge and battle everyone. The bridge of friendship, I guess. I also like the ending cutscene where AZ reunites with Fluete. Kinda cute. Worth becoming a meme format, I guess. Part 5. Too easy! We need to talk about the other big issue with this game, and that's the difficulty and the EXP share. It's only fitting that the game based on France has the most pathetic difficulty curve, their character might as well be German, right? This game introduced the infamous EXP share. Up until Generation 5, the EXP share was a held item to give to one single Pokemon, so they get EXP when your main Pokemon gets EXP. But in this game, they taste to a key item so that every single Pokemon gets EXP, not just one. So, actually, I don't have a problem with that. Look, I don't like grinding in games, especially RPGs. I'd rather be doing something productive like doing my taxes, instead of grinding by battling wild Pokemon. I recently played Sapphire in my own time, and I'm now traumatized from using the trainers I feature on the Pokemon app to rebattle trainers all over Hoenn. I think making your entire Pokemon team grow at the same rate is a really nice feature. That gets rid of mindless grinding. The problem is not the XP share, but the level of the Pokemon NPCs. It feels like they developed this game with the old EXP share in mind, and the new EXP share was added on like at the end, and no one play tested this thing because you get overleveled really fast. Like, you know how most gym leaders usually have Pokemon with much higher levels than you in the past games, right? Not in this game. Your entire team will usually have a higher level than the gym leader's ace Pokemons. It's not just the levels, the final gym leader, Wolfric, 
is laughably weak as he only uses 3 Pokemon, and one of his Pokemon only has 3 moves. The Elite Four only uses 4 Pokemon each. They don't even have rematch teams. None of the gym leaders use Mega Evolution in their battles too. I think only 3 NPCs in the game use Mega Evolution? Were the developers thinking we would be scared by it or something? I actually think Junichi Masuda or someone at Game Freak purposely made this game easy because it's the first game on a Mew console and the first 3D game that will attract a lot of Mew players. I think they wanted X and Y to be baby's first Pokemon or appeal to casual fans here. I don't know if this is a correct strategy that will make the game sell more in a business sense, but as a gamer, piss easy games are not something I want. At least they fix this problem in the next generation. Pokemon Sun and Moon might be many things, but I think it's the best game in the series in terms of difficulty balancing. The game has the modern EXP share, but the bosses in the game have high levels and is a pretty difficult game, even with the EXP share on. No grinding required, but still challenging. Fair and square. But then they broke it again in the next generation with Sword and Shield, and they made it worse by forcing the EXP share on at all times, because they couldn't trust the player making decisions, I guess. Classic Game Freak. Interlude From all this bad stuff I just talked about in this video, you might think Pokemon X and Y is a shit show and I would hate this game. But, I actually do not hate this game. I actually quite enjoy the game, and I enjoy it more than some Gen 3 and 4 games like Ruby and Sapphire or Fire Red and Leaf Green. Confession time. I only played Pokemon X and Y twice in my life. First time when it came out in 2013, and second time recently in the preparation for this review. So I have forgotten all the good stuff that was in this game while playing it in 2022 and I actually had a lot of fun playing it while on camera as a live Nuzlocke run recently. I had fun playing a Pokemon game, fucking shocker, right? What I'm saying is while there was bad stuff in it, like any other Pokemon game, it was enough to break my enjoyment of the game. And I would dare say, there was plenty of effort put into this game. <laughs> Look, I don't mind the story being incomplete or broken, as long as it's not insulting to my intelligence or doesn't bombard me with unskippable lazy cutscenes with god-awful dialogue. Pokemon X and Y don't have much of that, thankfully. Because Pokemon games aren't really about the story. It's more about having a fun experience. And most of the bad stuff about X and Y are story-related, so it's not a deal-breaker for me. Also, I don't mind playing easy games that much compared to other people, so the easy difficulty is not something that will make me hate the game either. But note that this is all personal and subjective. So... Let's now talk about the things that worked in the game, at least for me. Starting with, let's face it, this game is really a tech demo for 3D Pokemon games and is the main highlight and focus of the game. So let's talk about the graphics. Part 6, the graphics of Pokemon. Possibly the biggest hot take in the video, I think Pokemon X and Y is the best looking 3D Pokemon game period, tied with Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Yeah. I genuinely think Generation 6 had the best graphics in the entire franchise. Why? The answer is quite simple. Because it tries not to fucking overextend itself. Recently on Twitter, I saw some tweet go viral, praising that Generation 6 games looked really good aesthetically, and people were saying, oh, it's dumb media fans going through the cycle again. Now they love shitty graphics now. I just want to say these people, stop fucking gaslighting, damn it. When this game came out in 2013, everyone was floored by the game's visuals. I think the game looked amazing back then, and still do think it holds up today. Please keep in mind the system this was on. It was on the 3DS, and this game looked really good for the 3DS, compared to other games on the console. Like, I think most people don't realize that most 3DS games don't look that great, especially some JRPGs by third-party companies. The 3DS Pokemon games look better than the average game on the system, due to probably the art style that's just cartoony enough and use cel-shaded graphics with some textures. Out of the 3DS games I've played, the only games I can think that look better than the Gen 6 and 7 games are the first-party Mario games like Super Mario 3D Land and Zelda games like N64 Remakes, and that's it. Pretty impressive feat in my opinion. The problem is not the 3DS game's graphics, no. The problem Pokemon fans have is that the graphics stopped advancing after reaching the 3DS. Game Freak have been reusing the same fucking models and animations starting with X and Y till the latest Scarlet and Violet. That's almost a fucking decade now. It's like if Nintendo made Ocarina of Time, and kept using the same Link bottle till Twilight Princess, and Game Freak kept using the 8-bit sprites from Gold and Silver till Black and White. Anyways, the Pokemon models look good for their time in my opinion. Keep in mind, this is the first time for most people seeing Pokemon creatures in 3D. Yeah, there are console spin-off games like Colosseum, 
but the majority of gamers have never played that. It's hard to imagine right now and what it felt like in 2013, but we went from this to this, so the jump in graphics felt overwhelmingly huge. To share some of my memories of this game, I was amazed to see all my favorite Pokemon from the old games in 3D. I wanted to see what Pokemon that were to next and Y looked like in 3D so much that when the Pokemon Bank was first launched, I transferred my favorite Pokemon over to the new game, just to see what they looked like in 3D. I even went to the effort of bringing over shiny edit mons because I wanted to see them in 3D too. Boy didn't I think I would see these models for the next 10 years. Only problem people have with this game's graphics is the 3D. Not the 3D graphics, the stereoscopic 3D. You see, when this 3D assist 3D mode is turned on, the frame rate of XY drops to like 15 frames per second, and you can only turn on the 3D in battles and a few areas. But who the fuck cares about 3D? It's a shitty gimmick of the 3DS, which was the worst aspect of the system that only weirdos liked anyways. And most of you will probably be playing this without 3D turned on, or on 2DSs, or on emulators, right? Also, the game runs mostly fine with the 3D turned off. I did notice some frame drops when flying Pokemon were on screen, but it's a turn-based JRPG. It's not too big of a deal, at least for me. I see some people these days retroactively complain about the animations of attacks, but I think you have to remember that this game was designed for a console with a screen the size of an iPhone 4. It might look bad with the footage blown up on your 1080p modern devices, but on the original 3DSs, it looked quite good. And some attack moves were fucking amazing to me as a kid. I remember the attack of Brave Bird be super badass. Close combat was also rad. And retaliation was metal as fuck. Again, it's not this game's problem, but modern Pokemon games have never updated this and kept reusing the same fucking shit on HD consoles. Speaking of modern Pokemon games, you know, if they were ever gonna do a national desk cut, stop bringing back old Pokemon from their previous gen, I think it should have happened here with this game. Or at least, I think I would have been more understanding if they decided to stop it starting with Generation 6. You see, designing 2D Pokemon sprites and 3D models is a completely different amount of workload. It takes much more effort to design 3D models. If they said, since 3D Pokemon models are harder to make than 2D models, we will not be supporting the National Dex anymore in 2013, I wouldn't have been too mad. But the fact that they went the extra effort to make sure that every 721 Pokemon, 649 of them returning, gets 3D models so that we can bring them to the newest generation, make sure that every attack from the old games are in X and Y, it shows that they did still care in Generation 6. In the black and white to review, remember how I stated that they did things they didn't have to, but they did? Well, they did it here. They didn't have to introduce a Nintendo clone minigame of petting every single fucking Pokemon that existed till then with each own customary animation, petting zones, and facial movements, but they did. That's kind of why it's hard to hate this game and call XY lazy. They didn't spare any expense of making a real, full 3D Pokemon game. The reason why I call modern Pokemon games lazy for not having the national decks unlike X and Y is because they've been recycling the same models for almost a decade now. There's no single excuse for not having all Pokemon in one game, except for the lack of time or effort. How is it that a tiny 3DS game was able to create over 700 plus new original 3D models and animations, but modern games can't even be bothered to just port and copy 3D models and animations? Do you get the difference and see what's the problem here, you fucking stupid game freak dick riders? Part 7, 3 times 151 I guess I should talk about the Pokedex quickly before moving on. You see, this is a game directed by Junichi Masuda, so of course it'll have the 151 Pokemon on the local decks, because it's the number of the best generation and region. But, 151 has always been too small of a number, a complaint I had about Diamond and Pearl and Black and White. So, for this time, Lord Masuda showed us mercy and try something new. And we do have the 151 decks, but... There's three, actually. Basically, there's three local decks in the game. Central Kalos, Coastal Kalos, Mountain Kalos, each with about 151 Pokemon each, so there's about 450 Pokemon total in the local decks. The biggest number for a local decks yet, even beating Black and White 2's giant 300 decks. And I love it. You see, Generation 6 did introduce a lot of Pokemon. Typically in the past, each new generation would introduce about 100 to 150 new Pokemon per generation. 
but Generation 6 introduced 72 Mulans only. While this sounds lazy on paper, I don't mind. After all, we're seeing all the old Mons in the Mew Light with 3D models, so they feel fresh again. Most of the Mew Mon have really great design. Shout out to Gorgeist, Ice Slash, and Klefki. Also, as mentioned, there are such a large regional decks that there are so many Pokemon to choose from. There's plenty to catch them all and use in runs. Part 8 The World That Game Freak Was Proud Of. Aside from the Pokemon models, the rest of the game looks visually good too. First of all, the battle backgrounds. You know how in modern Pokemon games they can't even be bothered to render proper battle backgrounds during battles? I remember when you fight Rosa's henchmen in Sword and Shield on the streets of Winden, you just fight in blank voids. Or any of the city battles in BDSP, you just fight in orange fucking voids. Lazy, rushing, and cutting corners. However, this game came out before Yeshuem and Pokemon Go killed the franchise, so it's not lazy, rushing, and cutting corners. The battle backgrounds all look great. The forest areas look like a real forest in battle, the beach areas look like a real beach in battle, and most importantly, wow, a city with buildings, lights, and windows in the background when you fight someone in a city? Impossible. There's plenty of unique battle backgrounds too in this game. Notice how when you fight Shauna in Aqua Core Town, you can see the town square in the background. When you fight Karina in Geosench Town, it's not just plain forest background when in battle, but you see the town huts. When you're going through the route that looks like a garden path to Parfum Palace, the battle background matches that too, with the bushes and trees. When you battle in Team Flare's HQ, it has its own unique background too. And when you fight AZ in the epilogue, they have the red carpet, lights, and everything from the cinematic too. Again, this game is filled with effort, not lazy with detail. Just compare the details of the Battle of the Bridges. In X and Y, when you have your friendship battle on the bridge, you fight on an actual bridge in battle. In the critically acclaimed remix Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, when you fight Barry on the bridge of Canalav, it's fog missed because modeling a cannon will be too much work for LCA. In modern Pokemon games, it feels like at least the developers are conscious about how embarrassing their games look visually. But back in 2013, when you played XY and Oras, you can feel the developers are proud of how the game looks and runs. Game Freak was proud of the graphics! There was even a photoshoot mode where you can pose in front of the game's scenery. They were that proud! They tried to show off the game's visuals with cool effects like when you first enter Olympia's gym. This is straight up Super Mario Galaxy shit right here. Or when you enter an Elite Four room. We got a good Smash Bros stage from this. Or, they play around with the camera to show off the cool grandeur locations they built. Actually, the reason why I like Kalos so much is because many places feel grandeur with neat architecture and cool scenery. Places like Anastar City with Sundial, or Shallow City's Tower of Mastery, or Pathroom Palace's Garden with statues and fireworks are so well intricately designed, and these places look better than all of the Generation 8 games combined. There are places that use the camera's angle cleverly to showcase the design of the world, just like the previous generation. And there are just so many vistas I love in this game. I also want to give a shout out to just solid map design of Kalos. It pains me to say that modern Pokemon has basically given up on proper world and map design. It's just empty open fields with zero reason to explore or linear paths that a lab rat can beat. Kalos is different. I don't know if any fans will get offended from saying this, but I think Kalos has about as good map design as Sinnoh or Unova. This generation still followed a tile-based world in most areas, and overall, most of the route design is classic Pokemon excellency. Plenty of routes with optional passive items at the end, with some being unlocked through HM moves. There are also great dungeons with each being pretty unique, some having a cool gimmick like Reflection Cave where you have to use mirrors to progress, classic industrial dungeon like Pokeball Factory, actual classic ice puzzles that require brain cells made harder this time because you can use diagonal controls, and classic caves like Terminus Cave that you can actually get lost in and need to Google a map online. Bottom line, this game is so much fun to explore. This game actually has some great cinematic cutscenes too that I would argue look better than Gen 5 games. The scenes involving the legendaries like Xerneas and Evil Toss Awakening are animated great, 
And the final ending custom with AZ and the celebration looks greater than anything Shigeru Omori's babies pulled off in the following generations. Like, see the main character fucking emoting? How do we backtrack so much in the next generation with blank fish eyed Selene? It is evolving, just backwards. Part 9, so French. What I also love about this game is Kalos region itself. Kalos might be the most culturally unique and memorable region in the series. Kalos is so fucking French. You yeah. French pig! Okay, some disclaimers. I've never been to France in my life. The only European countries I've ever been to are the United Kingdoms, which was a miserable experience, and the Netherlands with Amsterdam. So I have no fucking clue if this game represented France well. French people, let me know in the comments. Anyways, every Pokemon region had a theme up until that point. Kanto was science, Johto was history, Hoenn was nature, Sinnoh was existence, Unova was truth and ideals, and Kalos is... beauty and fashion. Suiting for France, I don't know, but they did a great job serving up to that theme. We have an entire antagonist team obsessed with fashion and beauty, the main antagonist is a psychopath obsessed with beauty. The professor is one beautiful hunky guy. One of the biggest gimmicks in the game is character customization. There are other features in the game dealing with beauty like the PR studios, decorating your dog. Remember in the Black and White review, I complained about how Unova was half-assed at trying to feel like New York and America? Well, this game is fully committed to make it feel like France, or at least the image of France Japanese people have in their minds. There are so many restaurants and cafes in the game, the main city is literally shaped like Paris with all the buildings looking like Paris, and the gym is literally Eiffel Tower. You can work at a high-class hotel. You can beat butlers and maids. You can battle people and become knights and barons and shit. The root names have French names. Some of the NPCs even talk in French. They also committed that there is stupid little detail like being constantly asked to tip after doing something. It doesn't have any effect in gameplay except change some of the dialogue but you can just waste money and tip. I love this kind of stupid detail in games. It's completely unnecessary, but it makes the game unique and lovable. The only problem I have is the champion Diantha. She just, hey, what if Audrey Hepburn was a Pokemon character? They have the exact same damn looks and hair. It's not a coincidence. But when I think of France, I think of uh, Napoleon or Joanne of Arc, not fucking Audrey Hepburn. A famous actress who was born in Belgium who had British citizenship and worked in American Hollywood, is a French champion. Makes a lot of sense to me. Part 10, my dress up Pokemon trainer. One of the biggest known facts about Pokemon X and Y is that there is little to do after the post game. And that is only half true really. Yeah, there are no post game areas to explore, no battle frontier or world tournament to grind hundreds of hours into. Where is it? But there is something else. You see, if you just care about the main core RPG mechanic about Pokemon, X and Y is a pretty lousy game. But there is something else that's in the game that's frankly wonderful, that has nothing to do with battling and catching Pokemon. That is of course, the Fucky Trainer character customization. X and Y introduced character customization into the series, and it became a series staple feature after X and Y, appearing in almost every subsequent release. I would argue that X and Y still have the best character customization in the series, at least in the time of making of this video. Yes, even better than Sun and Moon and Sword and Shield. I don't know. I'm not a big fashion guy, so it's kind of hard to explain, but just the overall clothes option in Kaos is so much better. Like, Alola's clothes were just dumb kid clothes, but Kaos is so much fashionable and high class. Smartly, they have a lot of premium clothes in the game, and buying them is a quest of its own. First, these clothes are just really expensive, so prepare to grind with the amulet coin. Clothes sold in shops are different based on what day it is in the week. There's this clothing shop in Lumio City that you cannot enter until you rack up style points. There are also hair options you have to grind to unlock and yada yada and you get my point. For fun, on stream, I tried to have my character dress up exactly like Serena's recent appearance in the Pokemon Journeys anime. If anyone wants to try this, you can follow this tutorial. You need the felt hat grey, which you can buy at Lumio City on Wednesday and Friday. You need the sleeveless turtleneck black, you can buy at Snowbell City on Mondays and Wednesdays. You need the pleated kilt skirt red you can buy at Lumio City on Tuesday and Sunday. You need the zit boots black you can buy at Snowball City on Wednesday, Friday and the weekends. And a matching haircut at the salon with the bob haircut. And voila! You have Anime Serena. This all costs 179,000 Poké Dollars not counting haircut. As you can tell how rich this fucking kid is. Still, some of these clothes feel a bit sussy. Jesus, how short is that skirt? 
Thank God for censorship or this video will be demonetized. I also like that you can show off your own personal character customization with this thing called PR Studios. Basically, you can create a basic short film by putting on makeup, having poses, choosing background, choosing music, choosing a Pokemon to do poses, choosing characters, facial emotions, choosing dialogue. Also, you can unlock more features with style points and... Ah, you get my point? This game might lack a lot of stuff, but there's so much effort put into little detail like this, it's astounding. The only problem with this character customization is, Game Freak is blatantly sexist with the clothes. You see, X and Y is the only game in the series where I recommend you play as a female protagonist because you'll be literally missing out on content if you choose a person with a dick. It's because females have like double the amount of character customization. More hairstyles, more clothes. Females can wear both skirt and pants, but males can only wear pants only. Not biased towards female protagonists, are we, Game Freak? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I feel like there is one big new feature about the game I'm forgetting. Uh... What was it? Oh, right! Part 11. Mega Evolved. Let's talk about Mega Evolution. Probably the biggest hot thing that was all in the promotional material. The main reason so many were hyped for this game. This game introduces Mega Evolution. Some special Pokemon when held a stone can Mega Evolve during battle. Basically, they go into Super Saiyan mode. The stats go up, the design changes. However, this only happens during one battle and the Pokemon reverts to normal when the battle ends. It's really more of a form change than evolution, but evolution sounds cooler. Back when this was first introduced, I thought it was just a cool but just okay gimmick. Yeah, it's cool to see popular Pokemon like Gardevoir or Lucario get Mew forms, but meh. I'd rather see permanent Mew evolutions or forms. Thankfully, we kind of got that in the next generation with the regional forms, which is something I really enjoy, by the way. But after Generation 8 introduced Gigantamax, and Scarlet and Violet is introducing, uh... What do you call this shit? It should be named Crystallization! That's such an easy way to say! Uh, it's... Terrestrialization! Stupid fucking name. Anyways, after Gigantamax or Terrestrialization, I kind of miss Mega Evolution. Gigantamax just feels like, Duh! What if Pokemon became really big, yo? And Terrestrialization just feel like, Duh, what if Pokemon became erect, I mean hard, I mean a rock or crystal? Mega Evolution looks more cooler and a cooler concept. The Mew forms of all the Mega Evolution, minus Garchomp, looks badass as fuck. God bless Ampharos with the Fabian hair. But then again, I read some other interviews Omori and Masuda felt bad because only a select few Pokemon got special forms with Mega Evolution, and the rest didn't. So they wanted to introduce a mechanic where every Pokemon can change form and become special. This resulted in Z-Moves, Gigantamax, and Meph. I agree with this kind of sentiment. Hell, there's poor Flygon not getting a Mega. This sounds like a good idea on paper, but the fact that they gave special Gigantamax forms to classic fan-favorite Pokemon like Pikachu and goddamn Charizard kind of beats the whole purpose, doesn't it? I don't know, I have mixed feelings about Megas. It's a cool mechanic and feature, and I enjoy using it in X and Y and more in Oras with the newer forms, but I wasn't too sad when it was deleted in Gen 8, unlike the national decks. I don't know how competitive Pokemon players feel about Megas. Is it bad or good that it's gone? But for me, I feel no strong attachment to Mega Evolution, honestly. Part 12, Music. I also want to give some praise to this game's soundtrack. This review has gone over time anyways, might as well talk about this. Pokemon has never let us down with music, and this game didn't disappoint us either. But they could have. After all, this is the first game in the series that doesn't use in-game video game sound fonts for the music. They use digital original music composed on a synthesizer or with Ryu Orchestra for the first time, and put it into the game. So it's realistic music instruments being used in a mainline Pokemon game for the first time. Since this was Masuda and his team's first work on such a mute platform, they could have been uncomfortable with the Mew work environment, but they didn't let us down. Like, this game's soundtrack is amazing and super underrated in my opinion. While the Rhymos may be the worst in the entire series, I think their battle theme is the best in the entire series. Also, even though I have never composed music so I may be talking out of my ass here, but one of the limits of video game sound font music is that you can't play soundtrack with long notes and slow tempo without having it sound weird, 
because it's technically a bunch of beeps and boops. What I'm saying is that parts in the tracks with long notes could exist in the older games. For example, this part of the gym leader theme. Or this part of the rival theme. Or this part is the Sanders theme. would have sounded bad in the older games. It seems Masuda and his team build this about the new hardware and use it to their full advantage. I also appreciate that there's a lot of soundtracks that try to sound modern with crazy synth noises. But there's also soundtracks that use a lot of classic orchestral instruments. Pokemon X and Y was the beginning of a new era too for the music of the franchise, and I would say it was a strong start. Part 13, Minor Things. Lightning round with minor stuff in the games. X and Y have the fastest tutorial in the series. I might love this game just for this fact. I love how the game gives you the Pokedex starter and everything you need at the beginning and you're right off on your adventure right away. I think this was put in the game because some people complain about Black and White's long tutorial that lasted till Castilia City. That's great and all, but how the fuck did they completely backtrack this achievement with the next installment after X Y? Omori, oh, you don't need to explain every fucking mechanic in the game with long drawn out cutscenes with lazy animation. Jesus Christ, I'm having first island flashbacks with the Gen 7 games. I love the skates you get. Basically, you can use skates instead of walking with the 3DS's analog stick. It controls really well and has a very unique different feeling from the classic bikes. You can also learn tricks and there are routes designed with skate tricks in mind. It's overall great. I don't know why this was not returned in later installments. This game also introduced a new type to the series, the fairy type. While I was perplexed why did they go with light type, after all dark type exists, but still, I like that fairy type was designed to nerf OP types such as dragon and dark types, but it was also used to boost the poison and steel type. Only complaint I have is why is Delphox not a fairy type? It's literally a fucking witch and uses magic-esque moves. It's something from a fairy tale. I feel like they were originally were planning that, but they were worried players were gonna get confused because it was a new type. Trust the players more Masuda! X and Y had the best online system period. I like how the entire bottom screen was reserved for the online system. The UI is really well made and designed. It's super easy to use. There's no bullshit confusing shit like Sea Gear or Festival Plaza or Rotom Phone or Fuck a Phone. Simple, concise, and easy to use. X and Y has such a good online system. This was the only generation in my life that I actually tried getting into competitive Pokemon because battling online with random people was really fun. It's just a shame that Game Freak basically abandoned moderation as soon as Gen 7 came out, and now Gen 6's online system is just filled with hackers, and Nintendo's probably gonna cut the service in a few months. RIP. Horror battles are a new feature. You can sometimes battle 5 wild Pokemon at once. This is a meh feature. Since there's 5, the wild Pokemon usually have low levels, so it's easy, but super boring to get rid of them one by one. Maybe it was just an experiment to see what the players would think, and I didn't like it. Riding Pokemon is a thing in this game, but it's also meh. People have been asking for riding Pokemon since like Gen 2 or something, and you can finally do that in this game. Problem is, you can only ride them in certain areas for limited times. It does feel like an experimental gimmick. Worst, that fucking desert section of the Pokemon moves so fucking slow. Move your ass! At least they made it to a full feature in Sun and Moon, and perfected it in the Let's Go games. Pokemon got Mew Cries! Every Pokemon have updated cries and sound different from Generation 5. I am divided. While I think Generation 1 and 2 Pokemon needed mute cries because they didn't sound like animals due to them being 8-bit noises, I think Gen 3 to 5 Pokemon didn't need mute cries. Some of them were straight up butchered. I really hate Kyogre's mute cry. Also, for some reason, Pikachu only talks. It's super distracting. 
That's the end of the review, ain't it? I think I covered everything. Oh wait. Part 14. Looker post-game rant. I thought about skipping this part of the game for the review, but I think I should at least talk about it because, retroactively, this might be the biggest legacy Pokemon X and Y left to the series for years to come. The goddamn Looker quests. So, I mentioned how Pokemon X and Y have no post-game areas. Well, they kinda compensated us with something else, and that is a 3 hour long story quest that takes place in Lumio City. You meet Looker! Yes, that police detective character that originated in Platinum who was completely forgotten in the Gen 4 remakes. He signs you on a task to solve a mystery of crimes in Lumio City. It sounds like a fun idea on paper, again, but it's executed terribly. First, the game makes you just aimlessly run around Lumio City for a bunch of fetch quests. I haven't really talked about Lumio, so might as well hear. Lumio City is impressive. It's a huge city, and possibly the only city in the entire franchise that felt like a real city. Lumio City looks like a real city. Feels more realistic and looks better than Hollow Lee City in Alola, Winden in Galar, or Jube Dead Village in Hisui. There's so much fucking stuff to do, facilities, and NPCs walking around in the city. It's Castilia City upgraded. The problem is that there is no minimap, and it's a big problem. You get so lost easily, and a lot of the city looks quite the same, so it's really confusing where you're going. Also, it's circularly shaped, so you'll go around in literal circles. There's a shit ton of hidden alleyways, it's the only Pokemon city where you can get lost in. Lumios' problem is that it's too big for the system it was on. It should have been on a system where we could control the camera, and feature a minimap so we can know where the fuck we are. Bottom line, it's a mess to navigate through this place. Anyways, Looker makes you do fetch quests in this literal minotaur labyrinth. You get lost so easily, and most of the time you're backtracking to places. Worst of all, the game keeps making you visit old areas, just to see lazy animated cutscenes with ham-fisted, overly long dialogue. I'm gonna assume this part of the game was ghostwritten by Shigeru Mori, because it smells of everything about the games he directed. We have uninteresting, bloated out, dialogue cutscenes no one cares about. Also, another trademark of director Omori, just like the future Zinnia, Lily, and Marnie. The main character becomes a side character, and the story focuses around a different character, this time Emma. It's some bullshit, lazily written, uninteresting tale about Zerasig of Team Flare trying to put her in a suit to mind control her, and what? There's a reason why no one talks about Emma and have been completely forgotten about the community and the developers. She's that forgettable, and her story is uninteresting. And this whole looker quest is easily the worst part of the entire game. It was the only part of the game that genuinely made me upset and pissed me off while playing on stream because it was so boring. The game was frustratingly vague on where to go in Lumios, and I had to backtrack to so many places for 3 hours straight. The reason why I talk about this part of the game is because it was an eye-opening experience for me. This Looker side quest would become the blueprint for the next 10 years in the Pokemon series. Think about it, Oras tried the same thing with the post-game that was only made interesting due to the ending, the Delta episode. Sun and Moon's entire story became about Lilia's annoying quest about mommy issues. Sword and Shield, Legends are is only filled with lazily animated cutscenes that drag on forever that you can't skip, which makes playing it a pain in the ass, just like X and Y's Looker Quest. This, my fellow Jerrycans, is the root of all evil. The seed that started it all. Part 15. What would Pokemon Z be like? Anyways, back to Mist Potentials. I think I'll talk about what Pokemon Z would have been like if it was ever made. Another time? Another parallel universe where different decisions were made and things went right. Pokemon Z's story would have been more about Zygarde, just like how Platinum had Giratina and Emerald had Rayquaza. Zygarde wouldn't have been some bullshit collecting side quests, but a true legendary, a Pokemon that protects and watches Kalos' ecosystem from its cave underground. When Lissandre activates the weapon after capturing both Xerneas and Eveltal, perhaps Zygarde will appear and stop it, just like some other green dragon legendary. The game would also expand on the existing content. There will be more new Mega Evolutions, like how Oras added more, more Mega Evolutions for Pokemon that needed it desperately like Flygon. Instead of just Kanto starters getting Megas, it would have had the Kalos starters themselves get Megas. More of all, more clothes for coding options. Both male and female get equal amount of character customization. The Battle Mesa and Kilo City would be expanded into a real battle frontier. There will be more areas to explore in Kalos, sort of like how Black and White 2 expanded Unova. The story will be changed so the rivals would have more stuff to do in the game rather than be annoying time wasters. They will have proper arcs. The Sander will get more backstory and death and will be written better. 
AZ will have more stuff to do in the story rather than just be stuck in prison. Diantha will actively participate in the story and help the player. Sort of like how Cynthia did jack shit in DP, but helped out properly in Platinum. Problems will be fixed. Gym leaders, Elite Fours, and Champions will get proper 3D animations when battled. Areas like the power plant will be finished. The difficulty will go up. Either all gym leaders and Elite Four will use Mega Evolution Pokemon as their ace Pokemon, or at least they will use them in rematches. The level curve will be raised, so the game is not a cakewalk with the EXP share on. <sighs> These are all realistic expectations. I just listed out things certain games in the past did in the series. If they just invested one more year to make this game and release it in 2015 or 2016. If Pokemon Z was real, I think Pokemon Z could have been one of my favorite games in the entire series. And it would have proudly stood alongside Crystal, Emerald, and Platinum as the certain games that are the best in the entire franchise. But again, that is another world. Another time, another life. This review turned out a lot longer than I thought it would. I guess defending games that I think gets too much undeserved hate makes me talk a lot. While X and Y weren't very good games, uh, X and Y was a good blueprint. A blueprint for future Pokemon games to follow. Sort of like how Ruby and Sapphire might have been a mid-game on its own, but it wrote the blueprint foundation of modern Pokemon in Generation 3. I think the next game, Oras, followed this blueprint well. It became one of my favorite games in the franchise. Sun and Moon has some mistakes, but overall, still a refreshing game that stood on its own. A lot of people say X and Y was the turning point of the franchise, but I think I explained pretty well in the past that everything went to shit starting with the success of Pokemon Go and Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, not Generation 6. What a shame, this game has a really bad rep. I personally think this game is better than other first Mew console generation games like Ruby and Sapphire, Diamond and Pearl, and Sword and Shield. Ruby and Sapphire cause there's more stuff to do, Dominant Pro because it's not mentally cancer to play, and Sword and Shield because the game doesn't rate my eyes. The biggest catch rate of this channel is, of course, lazy, rushed, and cutting corners. While this game is an incomplete mess, I will say it's neither of these three things. It's incomplete, but there's a lot of work that got put into it, so it's not lazy. This game might be unfinished, but there's still a lot of stuff to do in the game, so it's not rushed, and I don't see a lot of cut corners. I guess what I'm saying is that X and Y wasn't at least embarrassing to play. Despite being an incomplete game, paradoxically, it's not an incomplete game if you think about it, at least compared to modern games. They didn't cut out any old Pokemon, the national decks are still here like Gen 5, all the major features such as triple battles from Gen 5 are still here, there are a ton of new features to be excited about like Mega Evolution and Fairy type that were carried on to the later games. like. It at least completes all checkboxes for a complete Pokemon game in my opinion, which modern Pokemon games even can't be bothered to do so. I think Kalos has a bad rep because it came out after the best Pokemon game that ever existed. Actually scratched out, a series of excellent 4 Pokemon games. So you cannot help but compare it to the previous gen games. Black and White 2 had the most content in a game ever in Pokemon history. And the next game X and Y is back to basic generation starting game. Of course this game wouldn't have another Pokemon War tournament. Of course this game wouldn't have two regions. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but despite it being 3D, Pokemon X and Y still feels like a classic era Pokemon game to me. For now, it's the last original game in the series that has everything in the classic Pokemon formula, such as classic 8 gyms, 4 Elite 4, Champion, Standard Rivals, Villain Team and Boss, and Victory Road. Before the overuse of lazy cutscenes, before the era of bad lazy overall design. Before the era of barely trying. I guess the only thing we can hope for is for fans to make a really good ROM hack or a remake that fixes all issues of Kalos. I want Pokemon XZ and YZ for Generation 10 or 11 if you know what I mean. But that will never happen. As we all know, Alcia is lining up Unova to pulverize and ruin. And Kalos will be up next after that. Faithful remake that adds nothing while keeping everything unfinished like the power plant same coming up in 2026. Hooray. Ah, uh, fuck. I guess I'll see you in Pokemon Scarlet Fever and Violated Violet.